for you. Notice of this meeting was given to all board members and associates in a meeting notice dated February 12th, 2024. Furthermore, on that date, a copy of such notice was sent to the Times, the Trentonian, and the clerk of the Township of Hamilton. It was also posted on the bulletin board at the entrance to the boardroom in the Hamilton Square Administrative Building. Please rise for the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll. Okay, we have a uh, roll call, please. Mr. Salentano. Here. Dr. Farrar. Here. Ms. Harvey. Here. Mr. Kanka. Here. Dr. McSheen. Here. Ms. Soto. Here. Ms. Stanton. Here. Ms. Byrne? Here. Here. Ms. Thornton? Sorry. Here. Sorry. Motion We have a quorum. I mean, okay. um, can I have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I think. Opposed? Abstain? Motion passes. Whereas NJS 10 colon 4 13 requires adoption of the board to go into executive session. Be it resolved that the board, pursuant to the Open Public Meetings Act, New Jersey, Title 18A, and the Hamilton Township Board of Education Bylaw, number 0166, hereby enter executive session to discuss a matter involving student matters, labor matters, human resource matters, and matters falling under the attorney-client privilege. Be it further resolved that the minutes of this executive session shall be made public following formal action, by the board and or at the conclusion of any investigation, due process, proceeding, or litigation, so long as not prohibited by law, and so long as the need for maintaining confidentiality no longer exists. Okay, can we call the meeting back to order? <laughs> so, um, good evening everyone. Thank you all for being here. I am going to move the agenda um, around a little bit. We do have a um, special presentation. Um, Dr. Altabello will be introducing um, our special guests for the evening. Hello, everybody. Um, so we're excited tonight to have uh, Wilson's fifth grade chorus under the direction of Mrs. Nace, who is uh, going to be singing two traditional pieces for Black History Month, Lift Every Voice and Sing, and Follow the Drinking Gourd. They will then conclude their performance with a fun piece, No School Tomorrow If It Snows. I checked the weather, it's not gonna snow. So without any further ado, the Wilson Chorus. Thank you. 
thank you very much for inviting us to perform. We're thrilled to have you at our Zoom tonight. And our fifth grade chorus is thrilled to present three songs for you tonight. So we're going to start off with a couple of songs for Black History. We'll start off with Lift Every Voice and Sing, which is a wonderful song, sometimes known as the Black National Anthem. But it's really a very wonderful song about looking at your past and looking forward to your future. And then we also have a song called Soft and Jersey Lord, which many of you may know is actually a song that's a laugh. It was about finding the Big Dipper and being able to find the way north, even when there were no roads, no streets, no lights. So it's a little bit of a map. And then we have a third song. I think our group that's been practicing No School Tomorrow But Snow may have made some of the snow days happen. I'm not sure. But our singers are very talented. So I think that we might have made it happen.
So, so students, first of all, uh, just another round of applause for our Wilson chorus here and their teacher. Wonderful selection, great job. Now I have a homework assignment for you. You need to record that last song for me so when I do close school because of snow, sorry I said it board members, I can actually play that and you can get credit for it. So. I think I'm not next. Thank you again, everyone. That was a wonderful presentation. And I always love showcasing our students because we have so much talent here in Hamilton and I love being able to celebrate them. So with that being said, we are gonna move on to our agenda. Again, I am gonna move a couple things around on the agenda. Um, we're gonna wait on the superintendent's report and I'm going to go to Board of Education. Do I have any Board of Education members that have any announcements that they'd like to, Dr. Ferrara? Uh, thank you, Mrs. Thornton. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that on February 8th at Grace Middle School, um, they held their annual Martin Luther King celebration, which included the awarding of the school's Martin Luther King Community Service Award. And this year, the award went to Detective Marlon Webb and his therapy dog, Sonny, and Sonny was there. Uh, Detective Webb works out of the Mercer County Prosecutor's Office of Community Affairs, and um, at the moment, he is piloting a grant project where he goes into the county schools and works with students using restorative practices. Um, you know, people mistakenly believe that restorative practices equate to no consequences. In reality, using those practices helps students reflect on their behavior and teaches them how to make amends. Uh, currently, Detective Webb is working at Grace Middle School, and he will be starting um, a program at Crockett shortly. He's also working in Hopewell and Robbinsville. And I would also like to thank newly elected Assemblywoman Tennille McCoy for hosting members of Steinert's Black Student Union at the Legislative Chambers recently. 
our district is fortunate enough to have the state legislature in our backyard. And as I looked at the photos on social media, I remembered the motto of the three doctors. Our children cannot aspire to be what they cannot see. So I thank um, Ms. McCoy for helping them see. And that's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Farrar. Do I have any other board members? Dr. McSheen. Um, I just wanted to thank the district for the opportunity for um, allowing me to read on World Read Aloud Day on February 7th. I know a number of board members, you know, Dr. Farrar. No, uh, I didn't read the bird read. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Soto, Ms. Harvey, am I forgetting anyone else? Um, as well as Dr. Rocco and Mayor Martin um, and Dr. Copeland too. Uh, we're able to read books that uh, I think we had however many books we wanted to, to read. Um, I, my kids demanded I read four, and I read one of their favorite ones, and apparently that was a favorite throughout wow. the district, so I'm very happy about that. Um, but it was really cool to have that beamed throughout the elementary schools in the district and have uh, some of the students be able to watch as we took turns reading. So that was a great opportunity. Thank you so much. Yes, Dr. McSheen had dad's superpowers, four books in 30 minutes. <laughs> a lot of practice. Really. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. McSheen. Any other board members? Okay, so we'll move on to our student representatives, and we'll start with Hamilton East Steiner, Melissa Simpson. <laughs> Mr. Salentano, can you pass over the microphone for Ms. Simpson? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Melissa Simpson and I'll be speaking on behalf of Steiner. Um, Steiner had a lot going on this month. We were achieving, we were busy, we had so much going on, so this is going to be a lot to say. <laughs> um, just to celebrate the month of love, we did have singing grams, um, and this is where students just chose a, from a list of songs to send to their friends, and they would just come in the classroom and sing to their friends, so that was really funny and an awesome experience. And just going on to sports, our Steiner wrestling team has been on a roll lately. We've been having so many pins being contributed by all members. Our own Rowan Lacey Cancel, she placed third in the girls' Creek Classic wrestling tournament. We were also able to celebrate their senior night and they won the overall game, so congrats to them. And we'd like to say a special congrats to Coach Panfili, who won the District Wrestling Coach of the Year. Last week, they also competed in District 21 Wrestling Championship, and we'd like to say a special congrats to Dream Hemingway, Alex Castano, Alex Hart, Elliot Morris, and Max Power as they have moved on to states. The Hamilton ice hockey team has also been on a roll with wins recently, and we'd like to say a special congrats to Mason Caruso for a thousand saves, and it's only his junior year. We'd also like to say congrats to Zach Messerol for achieving 100 points and also only his junior year. And they do have their state tournament coming up soon, so be sure to look into that and maybe cheer them on, support them. Our girls and boys basketball teams are repping Steiner well, and let's note that the girls have an overall 13th win in their season. On a Sunday, the girls spent time volunteering at the YMCA SCORE basketball program, helping the students just learn how to play basketball and spending time with them. So that was an awesome experience. Um, we'd like to shout out the Steinert's mock trial team who competed at the courthouse, as well as a special shout out to the Steinert's gallery class who competed in the We the People competition at Rutgers. We'd also like to acknowledge the Steinert's a cappella group, the Spartones, who competed at the LCHSA competition, which was in Bayonne, New Jersey. And we also want to acknowledge the Black Student Union who were invited to the State House by Tenille McCoy. And I was on that trip. It was an awesome experience. Like, the place is beautiful. We met all the caucus members and they spoke to us and gave us all these motivational talks. It was an awesome experience. And I definitely think more students should go on a trip like that. And lastly, we'd like to acknowledge the winter track team who competed at the sectionals. We'd like to say congrats to Anais Matos, Haley Zimmerman, Tyler Carocci, Lisette, Lisette Zamichelli, and Max Cawson, who are now moving on to state sectionals. We also like to acknowledge Steiner's Afterprom after is holding a clothing drive, and our Steiner cheer is collecting soup cans and monetary donations. So if you're looking to help out anywhere in the community, those are definitely things that you can devote some things, some support to. 
And lastly, our Mean Girls shows are currently going on today. We previewed in school what the show would be like, and it was awesome, it was funny, and it was interesting. So if you have some extra time this weekend, definitely try to come in and see what the show's about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Simpson. Um, next, uh, we will have Hamilton North Nottingham, Vanessa Brick. Good evening. I'm excited to update all on the vibrant and exciting activities at Nottingham High School. Our school community continues to thrive, embracing a diverse range of events that showcase the talent, dedication, and achievements of our student and staff. First and foremost, I invite you all to witness the spectacle of creativity and talent in our upcoming production of Chicago Teen Edition. Scheduled from Thursday, February 29th to Saturday, March 2nd, with performances beginning at 7 p.m., this show promises to be a captivating experience. Tickets priced at $10 are available on show for, showticks4u.com or by contacting the school directly. Additionally, we are delighted to extend an invitation to our annual free senior citizen dress rehearsal on Tuesday, February 27th at 6 p.m., offering our community members a special preview of the outstanding performances. On the sports front, our basketball team is gearing up for a crucial states game tomorrow night against Brick Memorial at 5.30 p.m. Your support at this event would mean a great deal to our dedicated athletes, and we hope to see everyone there. March 9th marks an important date for our school, as Nottingham's indoor percussion hosts their 2024 home competition at 4 p.m. This promises to be an exhilarating showcase of musical talent and dedication. Celebrating academic achievements, we proudly announced Nottingham's first Consumer Bowl win in history. This monumental accomplishment has propelled our team to the regionals and we look forward to their continued success. Our commitment to honoring Black History Month was demonstrated on February 8th during a special assembly featuring performances from our choir and step team. These impactful presentations showcase the richness and diversity of African American culture. Turning our attention to athletic achievements, Group 2 state champion Callie Holiday broke her own shot put record, a remarkable feat that reflects the commitment of our student athletes. Additionally, we extend our best wishes to Lincoln Simonski, who finished third in districts and will be attending regionals in Jackson Liberty. Lastly, it is with immense pleasure that we congratulate our outstanding educators and staff, Teacher of the Year Brian Emerson, Nottingham Educational Support Person of the Year Ms. Karina Fouché, and Guidance Counselor Educational Support Person of the Year, Ms. Debbie Weiss, exemplify the dedication and excellence that characterize our educational community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brick. And next we will have Hamilton West, Benny Ajay. Mm -hmm. Good evening, esteemed friends and family. I'll be speaking on behalf of Hamilton West. February has also been a very busy month for Hamilton. First, on the sports front, wrestling has been going great so far, um, especially for one of our players, Jerry Nicole Angeles, who's been racking up many pins. Just three weeks ago, the Hamilton West girls wrestling team won their first game against Trenton. On February 1st, Hamilton West Project Grad held a fundraiser with Palmero's Restaurant and Pizzeria to support the senior class with events like prom and just senior class trips. On February 2nd, the Hamilton West School proudly announced the date of the much anticipated play held by the drama club, The Adams Family. The play will be held on Thursday, March 7th, Friday, March 8th, and Saturday, March 9th at 7 p.m. in the Hamilton West Auditorium. So if you have time during those dates, you know you can swing by. Tickets will be reserved through our online ticketing system. On February 5th, seniors were able to vote for their senior prom theme, and voting ended on February 8th. On February 6th as well, Project Cl Grad Class of 2024 held a clothing and merchandise sale. On February 6th, the Hamilton West Baseball Booster Club announced that they will be hosting the American Red Cross Blood Drive on Wednesday, March 6th in the gym. And those who donate blood can get a $20 Amazon gift card. So <laughs> Hamilton West held a college planning night on Monday, February 12th from 5.45 to 8 p.m. And then on February 6th, the junior class unfortunately announced that the fashion show for the junior class would be canceled. But in its place, they're having a kickoff for the prom event. They will be raffling tickets for junior prom and gift cards. Also on February 6th, the Women's United held their second event, their movie night, 
which featured many students and all the funds raised during this movie night was used to buy sanitary products for the women's restroom, which will be put in place very soon. And also, during that same week on Valentine's Day, the SGA was selling carnations and just Valentine's where students were able to buy and all the money would be used towards senior class trips and just stuff like that. And lastly, on February 20th, it, the first, the eighth issue of our school newspaper, The Criterion, was released. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ajay. I always love hearing for our, from our student representatives about all the amazing things going on in our school, and it's coming specifically from our students. So, I mean, I, that's just great. Can we just get another round of applause for these lovely two ladies? Thank you guys. Um, so we're going to move on to awards and presentations. Um, we're going to start with the state assessment and benchmark data presentation and Mr. Scotto will be um, providing that. Thank you Mrs. Thornton. Uh, just a message for the Board of Education. If you do not want to move your seat, a copy of this presentation is in the board library for you. So if you need a moment to log into the board library, it is there. going to test my advance. Thank you, Mr. O'Boyle. So Mrs. Thornton, Dr. Rocco, members of the Board of Education, members of the administrative team, members of the public and staff. I'm Anthony Scotto, Director of Curriculum and Instruction, and I'm here this evening to present um, a variety of data, data that has been generated from state assessments that we are required to take as well as data that we have generated from our internal standards-based assessments. This evening, I will show you how the students did last spring on what's called the NJSLA, Student Learning Assessment. I will also share with you how our students are growing and improving on our internal data, which is standard aligned. We are currently collecting that data throughout the year because we progress monitor three times. Our district has made great strides in the area of equity and access by paying for all students to take the PSAT in grades 9, 10, and 11. I thank the board for your support on that for the last several years. I'll let you know how the students did in the fall. Our AP exams that the students take in May Again, I thank the, the board for your support in that we also pay for the cost of the AP exams for all of our students in the district. And throughout this presentation and throughout this evening, the steps that we've taken to address areas that we are concerned about, steps that we have taken that have shown growth, and steps moving forward. I actually had this slide in last year when I did this presentation because the students that were in school in March of 2020, I think it's very important to point out where they were when the state, the nation, parts of the world shut down. Our current seniors were only in eighth grade. Our current eighth graders we're only in fourth. My son, who's in fifth grade, was in first grade. Our current second graders attended pre-K if pre-K was open and families chose to send their children to pre-K or had to go to a plan B if preschools closed due to COVID and educated their children at home. First and second grader, uh, kindergarten and first, I've just listed them as they were at home. They were very young. If you're new to NJSLA, then I'll, I'll, you'll see that acronym that will show up on the screen numerous times this evening. NJSLA stands for New Jersey Student Learning Assessment. This is an assessment that the New Jersey Department of Education requires districts to administer. It is aligned to the New Jersey state standards. 
And they begin to test our kids as early as third grade. And for families that are newer to state assessments, or perhaps had testing like I had when I was in school, it has changed. They are not pencil paper assessments, they're online. Our one-to-one -one initiative has allowed our students to become more familiar with taking online assessments, but they're still rigorous and challenging. In addition to the content that the students have to demonstrate and perform and, and answer and demonstrate what they know, there are a lot of tech enhanced features that students have to do. So in addition to the reading and the writing and mathematics, you may have to use an online calculator. The role of scrap paper is very different in state assessments today than it was when I was in grammar school many years ago. Our students also have what's called tech enhanced features in literacy. So if you've ever read something online and you don't see the entire passage in front of you, you have to scroll up and scroll down. That's a skill. So there's the content that the children have to demonstrate, and there's also the ability to take an online assessment. Uh, that is not measured, but I think it's important to point out. When our state assessments come back, the highest score that you can get on a state assessment is a five. So as you look at the left of the screen, that would be the lower score. And if you look to the right of the screen, that would be the highest score. New Jersey would like to see that all students fall in what's called four or higher, meaning proficiency. I'll unpack the format of these slides for you. This will also be available on our website. So you'll have an opportunity to take a look at it further after this evening. So just to kind of unpack how this slide has been created throughout this presentation, if you see the number and then you see HTSD, that's how Hamilton Township School District did on the assessment. And it's the percent of students in that grade level that scored a one, a two, a three, a four, a five. So that one through five measure will be consistent throughout state assessment slides that you see this evening. Underneath, I have chosen to also show you how we did against the state. So if you're looking across, you would see the percents for the district and the percents for the state. The cohort out of this group here for mathematics that did the best, and we, we agree that these scores need, need further attention and, and remediation and approaches to accelerate and improve, which I'll, I'll point out, and I know Dr. Rocco will in, in a bit as well, is the current third grade, which is kind of interesting. We have seen across the state that mathematics is lower than literacy. As a former English teacher myself, with literacy being sort of a spiral skill and a process, that's a little bit different than in mathematics when there's a different concept taught every two, three days. So uh, I have read and, and articulated with many people across the state and uh, as a state, as a nation right now, we're a little bit further behind in mathematics than we are in English language arts known as ELA. Okay, so we have this data that the state has provided us with and then Something I'm very proud of in this district that was in place even before I came here was a very successful platform called iReady. And what we really like about iReady is our students are able to demonstrate their proficiency, their knowledge of the standards, the same standards that are on the NJSLA, three times a year. We use the term benchmarking. So the data, the data that you see on the screen right now is has been calculated after the second benchmark. Our students completed their mid-year benchmark actually just a few weeks ago. We have seen in math overall about a 14% growth. So growth is good. Could that number be higher? Of course. But we're happy to see that the things that we're putting in place, the instruction that we have for our students, the support of our families is showing. Okay, so now that you kind of have an understanding of the format, I'll go a little faster. So here's that same slide for English language arts. In this situation, as we take a look at our data, the cohort that did the best are our current sixth graders. 
because they take the test prior. So when I wrench in third grade from last year, those kids are in fourth grade now, and these students are in middle school. So over 40% demonstrated their proficiency. We also administer the iReady in ELA. What I think is really important and valuable for our district is we don't only benchmark in the tested grades. We benchmark in grades one through five in mathematics and English language arts. What we've seen so far is about a 15% growth in the elementary area, in the area of English language arts. Now we have middle school. Same slide, same format, just so you're familiar with that. Middle school mathematics, when we saw the data, we said to ourselves, okay, we want to see how they're doing on a benchmark. That's really important because it's a one-time snapshot, the state assessments, and then those kids move on because it's the end of the year. So we, we usually look at the data, we meet with the administration, we meet with the faculty, and we also begin the benchmarking process in middle school. We have seen a greater snapshot of proficiency as indicated by our internal assessments showing us that about 41% of the grade level is proficient. 44% in seventh grade math and about 46% in eighth grade math. Okay, so do we use Link It? I'm sorry, do we use iReady in the, in the middle school division? We do not, but we use a, an iReady-like assessment called Waggle. Waggle is part of our HMH math program that we just adopted two years ago through Into Mathematics. And it has a similar standards-based online assessment with grade level content and grade level standards. The standards do not change. So for us, this was good data to see in terms of where we are right now. Our students also take the ELA assessment in grades six, seven, and eight. Our, our um, performance in ELA was significantly higher than mathematics for middle school English language arts. With our current ninth grade students, when they were in eighth grade, over 40% demonstrating proficiency. We use a platform called iReady. iReady is used for two purposes, to data warehouse and collect information, and then to also administer online standards-based computer-generated assessments. So the data is showing us the percent of the group that's proficient. We're liking, we're pleased with the data overall, but we're extremely pleased with the current eighth grade with over 50% demonstrating their proficiency. Once you go into high school, everything changes. So we administer state testing in grades three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then we do high school English nine, and then algebra one, geometry, and algebra two. So it's not necessarily by grade in high school, it is by course. So that represents the percent proficiency on the state assessment. These students are now in 10th grade. So we administer the Lincoln benchmark assessment also, and that is showing us that approximately 37% of the students are demonstrating proficiency in English language arts. Okay, math, I just want to point out, is not only a high school content area. In our district, we also teach high school mathematics in middle school. We have some students at the middle school level that have accelerated their mathematics pathway as early as grade six. So you could have a seventh grader or an eighth grader or a ninth grader in Hamilton Township taking Algebra One. So it depends upon their math sequence. So I, I would encourage those that study this or study this again to know that this includes middle school. 
it's hard to run growth reports when we're running it by course as opposed to by grade. So what I did here was, I know it's a little hard to read, is I really wanted to see, particularly from a skills perspective, where are these kids strong and where is that being documented? Where are we seeing it? So as you can see here, these are the standards where the students are the strongest in Algebra 1, in Geometry, and in Algebra 2. We also have, have put a lot of time and effort and resources, including financial resources, into the PSAT that I pointed out at the beginning of the presentation. Aside from the data, it's a very important opportunity for all students to sit for the PSAT so they can say to themselves, well, maybe then I want to take the SAT. The reports that families get when their child takes the PSAT are invaluable. They'll tell you the types of questions that you got right and that you got wrong. We're constantly encouraging our students and our families to go to their college board account so you can go in and look to see how you did. So the first time that we administer the PSAT in our district is ninth grade. The average score for our students was 777. 10th graders, this is the second time they're taking it, was 818. And that was a slight increase from the prior year. We do not have prior year data for the ninth graders because they did not take it the prior year. And then our 11th graders, which would be the third time that they're taking the PSAT, score, the average score was an 856, which was a nice jump from the prior year where the average score was 841. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, wait, wait a minute here. So we have NJSLA saying this. We have benchmark assessment saying that. We have PSAT saying that. Is it, is it, is it all the same? No, it's not. And so we have to, as an administrative team, put things in place, but also think about how we educate faculty and how we educate families and how we educate students on how important it is to put your best foot forward no matter what assessment it is, whether it's a benchmark or a state assessment or a PSAT. We also rely on the PSAT in our district to identify students for what's called AP potential. We've made great strides in the area of access to advanced placement coursework because the AP potential is a report you run, and since all students take it in Hamilton Township, we will often invite several hundred students to our AP potential assemblies. As a matter of fact, we're starting those tomorrow at High School East. Advanced placement. This is the most rigorous coursework that you could take in a high school. Comparable to International Baccalaureate, sometimes you may hear IB, we are an AP district. We have not only done a great job in terms of access and funding the exam, but we've also added coursework. We are up to 25 advanced placement courses. We have them in all of our departments, whether it be art, music, science, English, etc. The highest score that you can get on an AP exam is a five. Colleges and universities, usually when a student scores a three or higher, will consider them to bypass college courses if you scored a three or higher. We do not determine what that cut is. So one institution may want a four, one institution may want a five, one may want a three. May not, one may not necessarily be concerned about the score, but be impressed that you took college level coursework in high school. We administered over 850 exams across the district. Our percent scoring a three or higher has not dropped at all. We were about the same last year with 40% of our students scoring that three or higher, which is very good. We're all teachers as administrators also. We have our teachers. We have our support staff, we have our Board of Education, we have our budget, we have our community. And I think we all say, we're not going to settle. And we're going to think about, well, okay, so what do we do now? What are you going to put in place? And there's been a lot of things that this district has put in place this year that I'd like to highlight. 
I thank the Board of Education last year in the budget for allowing us to hire additional basic skills and ESL staff. We're in our second year of our school-wide reading series program in grades K to two. We've been administering the Hegarty assessments to assess where our students are in the area of phonemic awareness. Quick side note on that, I'm very active in one of my professional organizations across the state. I haven't even had a chance to share this with Mrs. Audino, but there's been some legislation that districts should consider administering three times a year where students are in the area of phonemic awareness. I felt really good when I was in that meeting today to say, we're already doing that. And we're looking at that data to provide students with intervention. For many years, our, we were using the foundations approach in phonics, and we still have that, but we've expanded the role of what's called Orton-Gillingham, which is also a multi-sensory phonemic awareness type pro program. We've expanded the number of staff that have been trained in that area. We've had successful implementation of what's known as MTSS, multi-tiered systems of support. The best way I could describe that would be, what does it look like in the classroom, whole class? What does it look like when you have a smaller group? What does it look like when that group is two? And what does that look like when it's one? And how do you collect data and provide some intervals of support for students? And those are the things that we are doing across all 17 elementary schools. I'm sure you've heard us uh, report out that we have hired a company and that we are doing an in-class tutoring program across all 17 elementary schools. In addition to our staff that are being paid to do before school and after school tutoring. Come back to the math that you saw, which was lower than the ELA. The frequency of our math tutoring during center time is greater than ELA. Not that ELA is not important, but we knew we needed to provide a little more targeted support in that area in mathematics. We've adopted the first in math program, which strengthens math fluency. We have teacher leaders in the elementary division that are working, particularly in the areas of math and ELA with their peers. Our grade level meetings in the elementary division have a spotlighted standard, and it's usually the standard where the cohort was a little bit weaker on state assessments. And the supervisor is then sitting with the faculty and talking about strategies and resources to strengthen the instruction in those target skills. We are just about ready to send home our iReady family report. We've done this the last few years. So parents in the elementary division will see how their students did on iReady. They're very parent friendly and they show the growth if it's there for the student. And as I have pointed out, we have seen growth on iReady. So many parents will be seeing what would be a higher bar for the mid-year. We can't stop there and we have to make sure that we're focusing attention in the middle school. We've expanded our middle school basic skills program. We did not have a program like that. We did many years ago from what's been shared with me. We've reinstituted that with local funds and title funds and providing our middle school students with support in mathematics and English language arts. With a new basic skills team, we've also invested in running records, which is a very successful approach in literacy to see where students are individually with their reading level. We're running before during the day and after school tutoring. In some of our schools, we're even doing academic push-in. The administrative team, including the superintendent and the middle school administration, have been working diligently to launch a summer school program for students that fail two or more core subjects. We've been running our Jump Start to Algebra One program because we know Algebra One is a really important skill in mathematics. And so we've run that program the last few years and our participation has been strong. We've revised all of our math assessments. We felt that they needed to be more rigorous, tech enhanced, and more complex, similar to those on the assessment. Is that teaching to the test? No. Is it giving the students and the faculty the tools so they feel comfortable on the day of the test? Yes. We have STEAM enhancements. Our students, even when they're flying drones, are applying areas such as science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. We adopted a new science philosophy and program in the last few years called Open Syed. I've been in these classrooms and kids are articulating, they're writing across the curriculum, 
and they're engaging. All of those are successful ways to begin and continue to strengthen academic performance. High school. We knew with our growing number of L's, or now known as multi-language learners, we needed to hire a bilingual counselor. The board allowed us to, to budget for that, and we have successfully hired that person to work with students in that area. We knew that if students were at risk in the area of ninth grade ELA and math, we needed to have more sections of a double period, because some students, when they come out of middle school, going from 80 minutes of math to 40 minutes of math, that's a, that's a shift, that's a change. So we've, we've opened up additional sections. Our AP Jumpstart programs have been very successful. So if you're enrolled in an AP course for the following year, we ask if you'd like to come in the summer and get a jump start on AP. Our AP potential assemblies, using that PSAT data, has allowed us to invite students to come in and accept a challenge. We're in year two of our new high school English series. We're running before and after school tutoring. Nothing pleases me more than when a high school calls me up and says, Anthony, we're almost out of tutoring money. Do we have any left? And that has been the case in some of our schools. The role of teacher leaders is very important, working with faculty, engaging with parents, and looking at data. We've done an academic push-in, and we have found that that has been a significant way to raise performance. So if a teacher agrees to additional compensation, particularly in the area of math or ELA, they push into another ELA or math class and work with the students in a small group setting to provide them with support. For our bilingual students, we have also some bilingual staff in our district that have been willing with compensation to push into classes to translate and to help and to support our kids. We're piloting in one of our high schools the elimination of the lowest level, often known as level B here in our district, and we have seen positive strides. We have not seen a decline in performance. We've seen that students have been willing to take more risks and we are very pleased so far. It's still a pilot, but I wanted to share it with you. And the new textbooks that we purchase throughout the budget process are important because they often have the tech-enhanced features that are alignment to standards. And finally, at the district level, things that we've put in place. So it can't just be math. It just can't be ELA. It needs to be a full district effort. We've instituted bilingual office hours for families. You may say, how does that help with test scores? Well, if we're working with families and we're helping them and helping their students, all of those are collective ways to continue to address student growth and performance. ESL tutoring, monthly curricular newsletters for staff, digital family resources that we push out every month. Our superintendent of schools will meet with the principals monthly to talk about goals and data and performance and discipline and all of those things. Recently, I had two of our consultants come in from those assessment platforms I talked about. And sometimes it's nice to hear it from a different voice. So we asked our consultants to sit with our principals one on one, not in a whole group. So if Mrs. Thornton is the principal of said school, she has a 30 minute one on one appointment with the consultant to really go deeper into the data of her school about performance, about growth, about attendance, about graduation rate. It was very well received from the administrative team. Pop-up schoolhouses have been great. As we continue to engage the community, we feel that we will continue to also see this growth. We have a new teacher induction program that I'm sure you've heard me speak about and Dr. Rocco many times. We wanted to look at that. That's a successful program where we work with our new hires for four years. And we added in some curricular topics that the data was telling us the kids needed more support in. So now think about 350 new hires over the time of four years being here, that they all received additional support in curricular strategies. Our professional development continues to be strong. And sometimes just further educating parents on what assessments we are giving. And so for the parents in the community or the parents online, if you're getting school messengers a little bit more saying, our students in the next few weeks will be taking this assessment, we want to further educate you on those. We want to tell you about those assessments. We value that data, and we're hoping that it continues to grow. We're trying to make every day count, and we are doing it. We have worked hard. 
We know we still have a lot to do, but we wanted to take some time to really give you a snapshot of where we are. Thank you very much. Start. Do any board members have any questions in regards to the presentation? Dr. McShane? Thank you. Well, I do have a, a couple of points and questions. One, um, just a, maybe a clarification, you might have to look back at it. Um, on slide 16 for the geometry scores or the math, it's the high school math slide. Um, the Percentage of students obtaining the five score is listed as 15, but I think that's, that might be a <coughs> typo. Um, because the rest of the scores add up to 92.8%. Yes, it should be 1.5, not 15. And yeah, when I added it up, uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it might have, and that might not be correct too, because the rest of the, it still doesn't add up to like 99.9 .9 or 100. I will check that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then like on a, on a similar note, um, on the math slide, you, you mentioned that a, a number of our students in middle school are able to take kind of an accelerated course and take, pro, I imagine, Algebra 1 um, outside of, or as part of a middle school curriculum. Um, in your observation, you know, I, I assume these are the students who are able to take on that course load a little more proficiently. So do they end up skewing the, the overall grade? So I imagine you know, those are the students who are, are slightly more proficient because they're able to achieve that. So I think what you're referring to is the cohort of students that may be on an accelerated pathway sitting and taking that assessment the same year as the students that may be taking it in a more traditional pathway. It doesn't skew the data, but it reflects in the data. So it's pulling data from any student in the district that sat for an Algebra 1 assessment because they were involved in Algebra 1 content. That could be grade 7, 8, 9, and or 10. Because the state will say, if you are enrolled in high school content, you should be sitting for the high school content exam. And we have supported that because we feel that with that rigorous pathway should come you sitting for the reflective exam. Um, we also have some students, and this isn't just for Dr. McSheen, but it's for all of you, that even take high school geometry in eighth grade, while there could be students in grades 10 or 11 on their traditional pathway taking geometry. So those students that sit for geometry in eighth grade most likely will go into Algebra 2 or Algebra 2 Honors as freshmen. Whereas some people may not take Algebra 2 or Algebra 2 Honors until they are juniors, right? So, um, and I think what's great here is we've given the students the access. And if a student qualifies for an enrichment or an accelerated course, they begin the pathway. But if a student does not, we still reassess it at the end of each year. And so my office has put something in place where we reassess the levels of the students each year. So coming into sixth grade, I may not be ready for accelerated mathematics, but maybe at the end of sixth grade, I'm ready for accelerated math mathematics. And I have signed many forms where students have demonstrated strong proficiency at the end of sixth grade. I even have some, some students, I don't know if I could do this, but some students that can actually skip a math class and go right into Algebra 1 because we have enough data to support uh, that they have demonstrated the proficiency. We've become very data rich in this district, and I think that's an important point to point out to everyone, but it's not just warehoused. The data is there to drive instruction, to drive decisions, and to see how we're doing. And my, my last one is, um, thanks for going over the AP scores. That's really helpful and great. The, you say that there were 869 exams taken. Do you have any, um, I guess, estimate of how many students were taking those exams? I don't have that in front of me, but we have students, many in the district, 
that take more than one AP exam. I have seen some students take anywhere from three and four AP exams in one said year. So I don't have that file with me, but I bet if I was looking that up, the number of students, physical students, could be less than the number of exams yeah, taken yeah. because we could have students as early as sophomore year, definitely junior and senior year, enrolled in multiple AP courses, which is a very impressive way to um, make your transcript shine. Any other questions, Dr. McSheen? That's all, thank you. Mr. Kanker? Mr. Scotto, thank you for the, uh, the presentation. I have a couple of questions. I'm gonna focus more back on the beginning of your presentation in the three to five area um, under math and ELA. Um, I noticed that there was, the scores were significantly lower than I was expecting to see, the percentages. Um, but you did indicate that there was a, uh, under math, there was a 14% uh, growth from the previous year. How did these numbers, and with ELA, you, 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 you said it was a 15% increase, but how do these numbers compare to prior to the schools being shut down in March of 2020? Is there, were they higher back then? And we just, these kids lost all these, this uh, learning time, and now we're just start. We're basically starting from the bottom and trying to work our way out. So, um, very good question. So, first, let me come back to the percent growth. The percent growth isn't necessary from the prior year. The percent growth is what we've seen in the current year with the students. In terms of your second question on what were our what was our data like before COVID, um, we were right at or slightly below the state average. So. Um, are we performing a little lower, perhaps? However, um, it's not unusual, particularly if there has been interruption in learning, that this could happen. Uh, what the state has told us is be prepared to address learning loss, or what we call address learning acceleration, for at least the next five to seven years. And I think we hear that and we're like, whoa, but it, if you come back to my slide on where those kids were, it is those students that may have had gaps or interruption in their learning, and we, it's our responsibility to address their gaps until they graduate. So the students that were younger and having foundational skills interrupted, I use the example of my son. I think about how foundational grade one is, particularly in the area of reading, coding, writing, and math fact fluency. I'm fortunate that my son had the opportunity to continue, but if, if a student didn't have that opportunity or did or struggled, that, I don't want to say stays with the student, but is something that the district needs to look at for the rest of their educational career. And so what we find ourselves saying often, Mr. Kanka, is, okay, let's think about where that student was in March of 2020. Not to blame it on COVID, but the reality is, if the function of learning changed from being in the class, which we're all familiar with, to, well, we think we're gonna close for two weeks, so here's some packets, to we didn't see them until the following year. And even though we worked very hard and, and we're very proud of what we did, we were not in the classroom in a traditional setting that we were used to, and many of our kids were used to. And I think that is part of them for the rest of their academic career and how we address their academics, their behaviors, their attendance, and things like that. So, so did we miss approximately two years of data because of uh, the schools being closed in March of 2020? <laughs> So, Dr. Rocco, correct me if I'm wrong. The year that we, the districts had to close down, we did not have state assessment data that year, and I believe we did not have state assessment data the following year. Correct. And you so that would any... be two years of, of said state data that we do not have. So if we were to go back and check the data from, say, uh, um, 18 or 1920, mm -hmm. or 18, 18 19, 19, yes would we see a, a significant drop to when 
we came back in what 22 at full really full time we would see a drop that because of you know the uh because of the uh, the uh the students weren't getting the education that we you know were so that they were supposed to be getting well our students i think our we know our students were receiving an education but it was in a setting that no one necessarily thought was going to take place right and uh, i think i know that the way we handled the duration of that year the 1920 and then what we did in the 2021 was significantly better but we still were working in hybrid settings uh, cohorts and uh, so that does that does impact instruction it does impact performance i also think that um, if there was any trauma in someone's life during that time that is also a, a piece to be thinking about. And it's not to blame, but we also know that some families, some staff, some students experience other things during the pandemic that, as we would say here, are part of their emotional backpack and are part of, of you know, what their families experience, whether it be people losing jobs, family members passing or dealing with illness. All of that are, all of those are not blaming factors, but valid factors that could impact performance. We would like to get back to pre-COVID data. We would like to get back to the trajectory that we were seeing right before COVID. Um, hence why we wanted to also point out growth that we're seeing uh, in a more positive way on the benchmarks. You know, I, I was trying to get if the 1819 versus the 2223. Is, is this this is 22 23 yes. this data? well the state assessment is 22 23 and the benchmark data is the current year because current what happens year. is we get that data back after the kids end the year we get it in july and august and so it's hard to make a decision on what's going to happen so you usually look at that data and say what do we need to put in place for the following year so if my son was in fourth grade last year and needs support I have to be thinking about what supports he needs in fifth grade because the, the the state assessment calendar is it's at the end of the year so it's hard to make a change on a student's instruction when we don't get the data until the school year is over and the other thing that you indicate that you uh, showed us was uh six through eight uh math and ela you didn't give us a a percentage of growth in that group you only gave us a perfect percentage of proficiency for each grade was that was those those numbers lower than expected because of what happened the math did proficiency we, did, we, did we did our did we not grow as much so um overall? because it's a different assessment right it, it's going to look different so the way we run a growth report in iReady may be different than the way we run a report in link it Right, so we'll, so it, it will look different on purpose, not to, to move the data, but the way we run the report, because it's a different platform, it's a different test, different company. So we wanted to see what percent of the kids this year now are demonstrating proficiency. So that math benchmark assessment data that I showed you, which was the in the 40s, right. we were pleased with that. We felt that was very good data. And we felt that was more reflective of our students than the state assessment data. Yeah, I, I got here 41, 44, 45 for Correct. Um, the, the, the math for six through eight. Correct. But how does that compare to prior? 18, nine, I know, I'm sure you don't have those figures in front of you, but how does I don't that have, compare? I don't have prior your benchmark data in front of me at this time, but I have not seen it that high since I've been here. Okay. So I, I, we, we also think that having a new math series and revising those math assessments is showing up in the data, right. at least in the internal data. Okay, that's all I have, thank you. I hope I answered all your questions, Mr. Kanka. A question? Uh, well, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, Dr. Shotto, thank you so much for sharing this information. Um, and I'm the first person to always say, you know, I don't put a lot of stock in test scores because <laughs> um, I don't believe it's a, accurate measure of someone's intelligence and i know that because i was never uh, a good tester myself um, however i do appreciate the snapshot of data and its ability to drive change in the district 
And I just wanted to commend you and the rest of the administration for the work that you do to consistently evaluate and look at ways to improve. Um, I know, that, and I very much appreciated you opening with um, the COVID years. Uh, I was the PTA president at Crockett during that time. And I remember working with the administration there. As students came in after two years of being at home, um, basically being told you can't share, you can't be close to each other, keep your distance. It's a whole nother layer that impacts education. They left school and many families um, needed to figure out how to get internet in the house to get the computers to work for home instruction. They were wondering how to access food. All these other social determinants of health impacted education. And we're still, you know, um, bouncing back from that, but I think we're doing so well. Um, and in my short time on the board, I've been consistently impressed with what I've been learning as I enter the school. So I just want to say thank you, you, the all of the teachers in the district and the administration for the work that you do. Thank you for your kind words. It certainly is a shared collective effort. Um, I will often use the analogy with anyone. Think of data as blood work. And what is the blood work telling you? And what is the blood work telling you you need to do more of or less of? And so we have looked at this data as blood work. And I think about the times that I've gotten blood work and I've said to myself, well, I think I know why my scores are, my data, my blood work is high or low or good or improved. And what things will I put in place to make it better? And I think that mindset has been reflected this evening that we have seen this data as blood work and what, what do we need to do more of or less of? Thank you. Dr. Ferrara. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Thornton. Thank you, Mr. Scotto. Um, I just want to point out some things because it's been very frustrating for me as someone who holds a PhD to see some of the manipulation of data in the community. I can't speak for anybody else's PhD program. I can tell you the consistent message in my program was as you don't push the data behind, beyond what it tells you. And what this data doesn't tell us and let's use Mr. Scotto's example of the blood work. That blood work is taken from the same person each time. And so he can benchmark his blood work because it's consistent. The benchmarking of our data is not consistent because we are often not testing the same kids. We, are, we have children that move in and out of this district all the time. So you can't look at the data from one year and then the next year and conclude that we are testing the same children. We, in some cases, are testing what kids learned in other districts or didn't learn in other districts. I hear people in the community all the time tell me our test scores were much better years ago. Well, years ago, everybody did not test. Everybody tests now, everybody. Students in our special ed programs, everybody tests. And so I encourage people and my colleagues not to take this data, as Ms. Soto just said, so seriously because it's just a snapshot. It's just a moment in time. And not only that, it may not paint an accurate picture. I firmly remember in my grad school years, a professor who claimed, we were all in a meeting, that Ronald Reagan showed his conservative side because his flag was over the right shoulder, he wore a red tie, and the way he was positioned on the camera. And I asked that professor, have you ever been in the Oval Office? No, I've never been in the Oval Office. It, at the time, we had a cameraman and sound man, I'm sorry, camera person, sound person, and a lighting person in the Oval Office along with all the staff. Did I, I asked him, where were the plugs? Do you know where, how long the cords were, where they, none of that, none of that. But he jumped to conclusions about what he was seeing on the camera. And then I said to him, 
Do you know why people wear red ties on television? No, I don't. Well, it throws color on your face. So you can see something and jump to all these conclusions. And behind the scenes, there's data that is, just doesn't come into play. And so I really encourage people not to um, take this data as, um, as we're failing kids, we're not progressing, because it's just not true. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farrar. Any other board members have questions? Uh, thank you for your presentation, Mr. Scotto. Uh, I wanted to ask something that in part was mentioned already by Dr. Ferrara, but as Dr. Ferrara had mentioned, all of our students are now taking these standardized tests unlike in the past. Can you expand on how something like that might affect the test scores, having our uh, English language learners and our special education students taking these tests and how that would then possibly affect our scores as a whole? Well, let me first start with, it's our job to educate everyone, whether they're here for five minutes, five years, five decades. Um, so what we have seen in, in education, not just in our district, is students that have different needs, students that are a population that moves in and out, students that may um, leave the country and return, and so I want to first underscore that whether they are new or not, we have to still assess. What we've done in this district is we've made sure, of course, we've followed the rules and assessed all those that are required to be assessed. There's only a very small percent, very small percent, that don't sit for an assessment, and that is coordinated by the Student Services Office. So as the demographic, um, it could change or be reflective of that testing year. It could be that X percent are English language learners. X percent may not. X percent may be in our district one year or not. So um, I may not be answering your question directly, but the, the reality is we must assess our students and then from there decide what they need. Could it be harder for me to sit for an assessment if I'm not as proficient in a particular area, whether it be language or skill? Of course. And so I just think about outside of education. I think about when people are learning to drive. And there are those that are natural at it. And then there are those that need more support. And the goal is that they all pass the driving test and they obtain a license. And I'm not saying pass the test is the license, but I would think it's important that we know that the, the community has changed, the state has changed, the nation has changed, the world has changed. But we wanna make sure that we educate everyone and that we include all of them and that we provide them with the supports. I think about when I started in education almost 30 years ago, we did not have as much small group instruction we may have not had as many students that were identified, but still had need. So I think that's where we may have seen an increase in numbers because the way that our state, rightfully so, has identified students and what they need in terms of their supports. Um, and I think it, we'd be remiss if we didn't point out that the students we teach now could be different than the students we taught when we entered the education field in 1995. Um, the students I taught when I first started teaching did not go through a pandemic. They didn't have all the other things that many of us have experienced. So I'm not trying to dodge your question, but I, I just wanted to kind of paint a picture of, yeah, the numbers could be different. They could be higher, they could be lower, but we want to make sure that we see how they do to decide what to do next. I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. No, I just think it's important to show that now that we are testing the entire population that, like you said, things like certain abilities can fall behind because we're testing children that are outside of the typical realm of education. You know, I think if I, uh, as someone who has studied foreign languages, if you place me into an advanced placement class and I have not studied the language, could I perform lower? Yes. And then hopefully someone would see my low performance and say, okay, how are we going to help Anthony? And I think that's an important thing. And I feel good that we do that here consistently across the district. Thank you, Ms. Stanton. Ms. Harvey? 
Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Scotto, for your presentation. Just some question and slash observation. So drawing upon what um, Mrs. Santa and Dr. Ferrara have asked about, it looks like when you're actually comparing students who are at the same level, like Algebra 2 and Geometry, we're at the state averages. We're matching them. But when you take the numbers out, when you're looking at students who are in like grade level four or five, that those classes, all of those students aren't at the same level. In fact, we have different levels within those classes. So they might not, they might never have been at a fifth grade level, even though they're in the fifth grade class. Is Correct. that fair to say? Correct. And then the question that I have going towards the, the blood work examples, that's really what I care about, is that are we focused on, while it's not in our presentation, because our presentation is just the numbers overall and where we're falling into these percents. But really, these kids are tested in the fall, then they're tested in the spring, and you're comparing the spring data to the New Jersey data in, in this slideshow. Um, but we want to make sure there's no learning loss within that year for each student. We've looked at those numbers, correct? And, and our students on average are, they're learning each year, correct? Our students are learning each year. So that, that's the first thing to confirm. The second thing is we try to look at more than just numbers. And so if you recall, one of the slides I had up there had skills right? That's really important that we look at that across. So when we're having conversations with, let's say, fourth grade teachers, yes, we may say that X percent of the population was proficient, but we really need to go into the, the what. Is it fractions? Is it decimals? Is it citing text evidence? Is it reading informational text or literary text? So my office, along with uh, many stakeholders in the district, we not only look at the numbers, we look at the curriculum. We look at the skills. Because if, if you're struggling, I need to know, you're not just struggling in math, but what part of math? If I'm struggling in reading and writing, what part? And so, and I think for us, that's really been a, a turning point with what we've done with the tiered systems of support. So while we may be still running a traditional basic skills program, which has been effective, we're really looking at what does the student need help in within mathematics, within ELA. Uh, just like I, and I hate to keep using non-educational uh, examples, but I think it's important for all of us, me included, if I had a trainer, a trainer would look at what specific things do they need to work on with me to help me be successful. Thank you. And then one final question as to the AP issues and even any honors courses that are all students given the opportunity, even if suppose that they've never excelled and yet they want to be challenged and there's an AP class they really want to take, are they able to say to their guidance counselor, I want to be in that class? It's an area of the program of studies where we are the most flexible in terms of prerequisites. And sometimes people will say, but that's the hardest courses. But student passion is a really key prerequisite for advanced placement coursework. So a lot of times the appeals will come to my office as they should. And if I'm looking at the student, I'm meeting with the student and the family, and I see that there's been a progression of growth and they have a passion for that particular area. And that may be something that they want to study post-school. I will place them in the AP class. Thank you. Uh, just I wanted to add one other thing to that. If you want to take AP Calc, I'll say to you, yes, but I also want to make sure that you've taken the math courses leading up to AP Calc, right? So if you've only taken eighth grade math, could you sit in AP Calc? Maybe. I don't know if I could, right? So we also look at the courses that the students have taken prior, and that's most common in um, world language and in mathematics. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Scotto, for your very informative and detailed presentation. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mrs. Thornton. Thank you. So we are going to move on to um, the macro budget presentation for the 24-25 school year after the superintendent's report. Yes. So uh, <laughs> what you will notice is 
I am not giving my traditional superintendent's report tonight. Instead, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to convert the superintendent's report actually into, and I don't know why the top line is messing up like that. It's been doing it all day. But I, I've talked since August about three goals we have in the district. And what I want to do is I want to add a little detail to this to explain to you what the goals are, as I've explained and put in writing and talked about both at, at uh, board meetings and at all PTA meetings, at events, I've written about it in the community updates, but then I want to also tell you what the objectives are associated with that, how they're tied in with the strategic plan and the budget, and what are some of the details. So here's the problem though. What Mr. Scotto just gave you, this is a complement to that. So everything when we talk about student achievement that he just talked about and put those slides on at the end should also be on my presentation. I didn't do all those because I'm not going to go over that and reiterate that all the time. I've selected some things to uh, as examples to tie in with those goals. But what I want to talk a little bit about is the fact, and if you've come to board meetings, you've listened to board meetings, if you've read my updates, you will know that we have three goals in this district this year. These goals are based on the things that we've seen coming out of the pandemic. These goals are based on the performance of our students academically, their attendance, and the behaviors in our buildings. Nobody's shying away from these things. Nobody is saying that these don't exist. We have put plans in place to address these issues. So, academic goal, goal number one, we want our students to be successful. That ties in with our strategic plan under student academic success, social emotional wellness. Within the budget presentation, and unfortunately you're gonna to have to hear me for two presentations tonight, because right after this I'm giving the budget 50,000 foot view presentation. But it ties in with goal one of equity, goal two of learning acceleration and SEL, and goal three of New Jersey standards of learning. Our attendance goal ties in with the same uh, goal with the strategic plan of student academic success and social emotional wellness and climate and culture. It ties in with our budget goals of one, two, and three. And then if you look at behaviors, it also connects with the same student academic success and social emotional wellness of our strategic plan. And within our budget goals, one, two, three, and four. And as I said before, I've been discussing about these goals for months now, but I think we should do an update and give you some some ideas of what we've been doing to move these go goals forward and to make progress. So before I do that, I also want to be very clear when I say these are our goals. These are our goals. Every one of us is responsible for this. So if you are a principal, a supervisor, a teacher, a director, a superintendent, a student, a family member in our community, it all counts. Every day counts. We're all part of this. These are all our responsibility. So goal one is academics. And the objective is, and I'm not going to read every item to you, so I'm not reading off every slide, but I, some segments I will. The objective is to improve academic performance of students in all core subjects as evidenced by standard-based internal and external assessments. The external of the state, the internal are the ones that Mr. Scotto has been talking about. You can see the steps that we have taken, and there's multiple slides on this. And I put an asterisk here to say that Mr. Scotto's presentation provides additional information in the academic areas of steps that have been taken. But you can see all the different things that we've been doing here from programming that we've put in to identify students that have concerns and to, to develop programming in different tiers to assist them, to professional development that we've developed, to revising curriculum. Our program of study at the high school is robust. You should take a look at that. And also the budget that we put together last year and we are developing this year to support academics. If we continue on those steps, one of the things we're very proud of is our new teacher induction program. Mr. Scotto talked about the fact that we identified writing as a concern. And instead of phasing writing into year one for our new teachers, we actually put it in for year one, two, three, and four. So our, all our non-tenure teachers are getting training on writing, no matter what their subject is. We should be writing in all of our subjects. 
Uh, you can also see a couple other, other sessions that we've done with our new teacher induction. We've taught about differentiation, uh, student engagement, building reading comprehension. We put out the digital resources, as Mr. Scotto has said, and then monthly principal meetings. Myself and our supervisor of data every month go and meet with groups of principals. They're allowed to self-group. Our high school principals have self-grouped, our middle school principals have self-grouped, and our elementary principals have broken into four groups. Every month, I just had my middle school meeting today. Today we were going over academic data. We were going over the growth we are seeing in academics and the areas where we might be struggling and what are we going to do in February to make sure by June students are learning. The other thing that we're doing, and it's on another slide here, but the other thing that we're doing is we are meeting as a group with the middle school principals, three supervisors, secondary supervisors, the math supervisor, the ELA supervisor, the special ed supervisor, tech department uh, person, Mr. Scotto, myself, and supervisor of data, and we are developing out a middle school program for academics for students who have failed two classes two academic classes, two marking periods. This is why this is important. We do summer tutoring, we work with our students, we make sure that they come to, to summer school to, to learn. But what we're telling families and students, and the important piece here is families, that a child's learning is important. And we want them to leave middle school with a certain skill set so that they are successful in high school. One of the benefits of having these meetings with the different levels of principals is our high school principals say there is culture shock for our freshmen coming in, especially when it comes to academics, because a couple of students will learn very quickly they're ineligible for everything because they're failing classes and they don't understand why. Right, so now we're putting what I'll call teeth into academics in the middle school level and making sure that students understand and families understand the importance of learning and passing. Our goal is to make sure that every kid is learning. So some other things in academics that we're doing, uh, building level tutoring before school, after school summer program. As Mr. Scotto said, we have the tutoring corps in here. We have the graduation rate committee. Two, three years ago, we put a committee together of secondary administrators to look at the graduation rates, to identify why students weren't graduating, to figure out how we could increase our graduation rates. And we've seen increases and steadiness in our graduation rates. And we set a level of 90% or higher graduation rates. And I'll show you what our graduation rates are for last year. And more professional development that we're doing. Actually, I could put up 15 pages of professional development that we do in this district every year. Mr. Scotto's department, Ms. Audino's department, other departments put together an amazing list of professional development for all of our staff. Uh, additional academic steps that are taken, we have teacher leaders as we talked about, we have our Hagerty assessment, we have our revised math assessments, we have a number of special education programs that are assisting our students, uh, we have a social skills, life skills training program for our students to help our students who are going out into workplace readiness to prepare for the interactions that they're going to have with the public, uh, and we have a program that's a hands-on program for our students in our autism program. So what's some of that evidence? Well, Mr. Scotto showed you a lot of evidence of overall growth we're seeing in the grade level. But if you look at the number of students that we're seeing growth in, and these numbers we just pulled today, I met with Mr. Scotto uh, and our data supervisor just to make sure that we're looking at these numbers correctly, but grades one and two, about 87% of our students are demonstrating the growth he reported out uh, in ELA. In math grade one and two, 88% of students are demonstrating positive growth between fall and spring, fall and winter benchmarks. In grade three, four, and five in ELA, 75% of students are demonstrating positive growth between the fall and winter benchmark. Grades three, four, and five in math, 82% are showing positive growth between the fall and winter benchmarks in uh, in using our iReady platform. And I think that's important for us to understand that we are seeing growth in the vast majority of our students, how much growth Mr. Scotto was talking about with you when he showed you the data on our internal assessments. 
Some other stuff at the middle school math, we're seeing 62% of our students is experiencing positive growth, so 62% of them are growing. ELA benchmark two is not in yet, so I don't have that. And then at the high school level, we base it on graduation rate. And you can see Steiner was at 93.2% for the class of 2023, North was at 90.2, and West was at 90.1. Again, as I said to you, we're setting the base at 90%. That's where there and higher we want to be with our graduation rates. The second goal is attendance. If they don't come to school, they can't learn. We've been working on attendance since before the pandemic. We have a grant through the Princeton Area Community Foundation. They've worked very closely with us over uh, six years now. And we had seen a lot of growth when it came to improving attendance in our district prior to the pandemic. Then the pandemic came, our numbers of chronic absenteeism spiked, and now they are coming back down. We've done a lot of work. Part of my data meetings involve conversations about student attendance. How are we focused on students and families and explaining the importance of coming to school? Uh, we review that data. We set up school bulletin boards and displays for attendance with our campaigns. We send out handouts to families and have different orientations on it. We have different nights for families where we talk about attendance. I write about attendance in my communication. Families call, uh, families get calls from the schools and their principals and their teachers about attendance and the importance of coming to school every day. And we put out some data about the fact that something as simple as this. Being absent two days a month doesn't seem a lot. Now multiply that by 10 months of the year. You're chronically absent. Once you hit 18 days, you're considered chronically absent by a state standard. You're out two days a month, you're out 20 days. So it's important to understand, if you're sick, stay home. You have a fever, stay home. Otherwise, we want you to come in and learn. We want you to be part of the school. And just recently, I had a chance to go down to Washington, D.C., and I was part of a panel discussion with a number of researchers, uh, somebody as a part of an organization, and a state superintendent uh, for a national forum on chronic absenteeism, and they were interested in the work that we're doing here in Hamilton and some of the success we're having because right now, 20 of our 23 schools have a chronic absenteeism rate of less than 20%. Three of those schools, the remaining three, are actually within 1% of that 20 percent we are trending to improve our chronic absenteeism rates over last year in the majority of our schools uh, all three and this is very exciting news all three of our high schools currently below the state average of chronic absenteeism and one of our high schools uh, has cut its rate in half and uh, and two of our elementary schools have done the same and then this is absolutely outstanding three of our schools have chronic absenteeism rates below 10%, and those are super low numbers. So that's exciting stuff with uh, chronic absenteeism and attendance. And then behaviors, and we make no bones about this. Um, we wanna make sure that when students come to school, students are coming to school and behaving. I sent a letter out to every incoming sixth grader, every incoming ninth grader. The middle school principals and the high school principals mimicked language in those letters to everybody else saying, we have goals about your academics, your attendance, and here's our expectation for your behaviors. And so we've taken a look at behaviors and we've taken some action steps here. And I thank the board because the board has funded a number of these action steps to make sure that we can put things in place to support our students, to support our teachers, and to provide a better environment for everybody who works and learns in our schools. So we have focused on safety on all levels, okay? So we have a leveled, uh, um, focus on, on safety and security. We've done a lot of professional development. Uh, we've done professional development generally on school safety, on social emotional uh, learning and mental health, on behavior support, so teachers have the skills to support kids that maybe are having a, a bad day or being disruptive or maybe uh, just having difficulty in general. We've sent 10 of our elementary teachers and we've purchased the material for what's called sand play in the classroom. We've piloted an SEL program for behaviors at three of our elementary schools this year. We are fully implementing that program at all 17 of our elementary schools next year. Every one of our schools does a number of programs, and, and sometimes those programs are from outside organizations. Sometimes they're run by our guidance counselors or our principals. 
a lot of our principals, specifically at the middle schools and high schools, will have class meetings or they'll go into English classes or they'll go into gym classes and they'll talk with students. And we put two floating guidance counselors in the district to assist our guidance staff when there is a need or there is a crisis. And our guidance department is right now reviewing the curriculum to address behavioral issues and bullying intervention. Other things, when I talked about security, I said we had layered security in the district, and I'm not going into a lot of detail, because if I go into detail about what our security is, then we have no security. So understand, I'm not giving a lot of detail. This is stuff that we've talked about over the years. We have a new safety coordinator. He's amazing. He's out in every building. He goes to four, five, six, seven buildings uh, a, a day. We have budgeted resources and hired security for the secondary division. We have weapons detection systems. We have all 17 of our schools have campus monitors. Very proud to say thank you to the Board of Education. Thank you to the police department. Thank you to the town council and the mayor. Our lead officers will now be SRO officers. And what that means is they have specialized training to work with our students. They go to school for that. And we're excited to have them as SROs in our buildings. All of our buildings have handle with care crisis teams and threat assessment teams, and we've enhanced the discipline code for infractions. Um, that will mean that students, when there is an infraction, will have more days out, but it is resulting in less infractions. Uh, we've also done a number of professional developments associated with behaviors and safety, and you can see a couple of those right there. So what does it look like? Uh, if you look at the data, and Dr. Altabello puts this out all the time, uh, and he does two presentations a year on this. If you look at the time period of September 1, 2022 to September 1, 2023, there were 3,806 misconduct violations at the secondary level. The same time period this year, there were 2,612. That is a reduction of 31.3%. All secondary schools have reduced their code of conduct violations. So we've seen improvement in all six of our secondary schools. And what we need to also understand is that the majority of our students do not have issues in school. So there was at this snapshot of time, 6,966 secondary students, six through 12, and we'll put this up. So if you wanna take notes, you can take notes, but we'll put this up for you. 96.3% never engaged in an incident of violence. 98.6% never engaged in an incident of vandalism. 99.1% never engaged in an incident of substance abuse on school property. 98.1% have never engaged in physical altercations on school property. 96.2% of our students at the secondary level have never been suspended in or out of school from school. And I think that's important to understand when we look at incidents and when we look at our students. The vast, vast, vast majority of students are not engaged in those type of activities. And so that gives you a little bit, and again, I apologize for the, the top uh, title there. I don't know why it's messing up, but that gives you a little bit of a snapshot of what these goals are, what we've been doing, what the plan is, and some of the data associated with it. Let me also finish with this. We're not done. I wanna be very clear. We're not done with the academics, we're not done with the attendance, and we're not done with the behaviors. These are goals we will finish the year out with, and then we will reassess. These are the exact same three goals that I will work with our principals on next year to improve the numbers from this year to next year. With that, I'll open it up to questions from the board before I go to my budget presentation. Do any board members have any questions? Dr. McSheen. Thank you, Dr. Rocco. It's very informative. Um, and you know, I think you rightly point out the interplay between or among the three goals, the academics, attendance, and behaviors. Um, one thing that's always on my mind, and especially throughout the, the pandemic and recovering from that, is mental health, especially for the students and for the staff as well. But for the students in this case, um, can you talk about, you know, many of us, I, I think, have 
alluded to a mental health day, right? You need a mental health day to just get a break from everything. And can you talk about one, you know, how does that kind of reflect in the student population? Not that they're coming to talk to you and say, oh, I need a mental health day, I'm not coming to school. But, you know, is, are there programs in schools that, that you know, encourage them to come even if they're not feeling emotionally well um, and programs that help them kind of recover that throughout the day so that they are in school. Yes, yeah, there, there's a number of programs. Uh, Ms. Ferlato, who was not able to make it tonight, uh, as our director of guidance has worked with our guidance staff to get them training so that they can work in small groups and individually with students, individual sessions to make sure if a student is really struggling one day with their mental health, to give them the strategies that they need to be successful and get back into the classroom. Uh, one of the examples that I will give you, it's a very simple example, but it's a cute example, and I really like it, is the McGalliard guidance counselor set up a Bitmoji classroom that, what, that's a calming room. And it has all the different resources. So if a kid's having a tough day at home or at night or even in school, they can click on, they can click on different types of resources, uh, different types of activities they can do. And then there is a YouTube video that's linked to just the sound of rain. And I know that sounds very simple, but just that sound is a calming sound for kids. But then what can you do when you're feeling anxious? different types of resources. So our guidance staff has been trained to do that. They also run different programs for small groups throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the month. And they do group students that maybe have similar concerns so that they can work together and provide support for each other. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McSheen. Any other board members have any questions? Okay. Dr. Rocco, if you'd like to go into the macro budget presentation. Yes, yeah, so I get to go into the next fun thing. Uh, so, so this is a 50,000 foot view of the budget. There are no specific details with we're putting this in, we're putting that in, we're putting this in. This is just about the drivers and giving you some big data to tell you what is, what is helping us form our budget moving forward. And we're going to be presenting uh, a tentative budget in March and the final budget in April. And so, uh, so give you a couple of things. I always start, and if you've come to these meetings or you've watched these meetings online, this format looks the same. It's a very simple format, so you're gonna see very similar things. This is the budget calendar. We're on the 21st and we're doing the macro budget. The reason why we put a budget calendar up for you is to let you know that we just don't put slides together and say, here's the budget. We actually start the budget in December. There's lots of stuff that go into the budget and it goes all the way till April 25th when Ms. Atwood hits enter on the state system and we submit the final approved budget by the Board of Education. Okay, so I referenced goals with the budget when I talked about our three goals. Well, here they are, and we have three goals for the fiscal year 25 budget. They are equity, which means that we get the, the materials, resources, and personnel that schools and students need to be successful. We don't say we're going to get five BSI teachers and spread them evenly around the, around the district. One building might need one full-time teacher there with them all day long, and one building might need somebody there for half the day. That's equity. Giving everybody the exact same is equal. Learning acceleration, as Mr. Scotto has talked about and I've talked about, it's very important for our students to learn. It's very important for us to continue seeing growth among our students, but that also means addressing all the needs that students have academically, socially, and emotionally. Uh, we also talk a little bit about our student learning standards, maintaining and enhancing our programs. And again, I go back to our program of study. If you've never seen it, we continue to add to the classes our high school students can take. And there are really great classes that I wish were there when I was in high school, but it, it sparks an interest with a lot of different kids. Then the issue of security, safety, that goes into student behaviors. That's our fourth goal. And budget stability. One of the things we've tried to work on while I've been here is to try and get away from these ups and downs in the budget. Put lots of stuff in the budget one year, cut the budget the next year. We've tried to even this out as best as possible. Sometimes we, we've been successful, sometimes we've been moderately successful with it. So those are the five goals that we have when we're building out this budget. What is a major driver? Well, our attendance is a ma major driver. We've had a de two demographic studies. 
The old demographic study is in red on there, and that projected our enrollment. The new demographic study is in orange on there. The reality of our attendance is in blue. Even with the most recent demographic study, our student enrollment exceeds projection. Now, Ms. Atwood has our demographer looking at the most recent data and is going to reassess those projections, but you can see we are, per, we are over 1,200 when this snapshot was taken, and I believe this was the October 15th numbers, or these the, I'm sorry, my glasses on. Yes, the current year. Yeah, current year, October 15th numbers. So, so we're about uh, 12,100 students or so, and we continue to grow faster than what was projected. Another one of our big drivers are within our student population, our English language learners. And so if you've seen these slides before, they used to look like a series of lollipops and we break it out into smaller groups. Today we've broken it out into larger numbers. Our English language learners in 21, 22 were 572. Today, 23, 24, right now in February of 2024, 964. That is a very fast growing student population that requires some additional staff materials and resources. Another huge driver is charter school enrollment. And we right now are waiting on a decision by the state to see if a new charter school has been approved. If it is, we've added it in here and there's going to be a spike in the amount of money we pay to charter schools. And remember, Charter school payment comes out of our budget, and we're going to give you that number in a second, but the number is going to go from 316 to 755. State aid allocation, you can see there was 11 years where there was either flat or a little dip. We have recently started going back up. How does that translate into the state funding formula? Well, we are still underfunded in two categories, transportation aid and security aid, based on the way the formula says we should be funded. So we're short 3.2 million in transportation aid and 1.4 million in security aid. According to the formula, we are fully funded in special education at about 13.4 million. That is not our total budget for special education. That's just what the state funds us. Now, going to the state aid number, we are right now the, going to the charter school number. We are now paying $5.4 million in charter schools. If that charter school is approved and fully seated, that number will go to $13 million. That's a $7.5 million increase. All those slides are drivers that are impacting how we build this budget. When we talk about this big uh, ebb and flow to the budget and we try not to have that, that's gonna cause a dip. I'll tell the public right now, that will cause a dip. Here are the other things that we're working on. We need to increase staffing, that's a budget driver. Uh, the charter school we talked about, the ELL we've talked about. Uh, we have growth in out of district placement costs. We have transportation costs going up about 5.8%. Our medical and prescription costs are going up. Uh, inflation, inflation costs on everything we buy, purchases, materials, supplies. Uh, we have space limitations, and we're dealing with that as our enrollment increases. Uh, we are dealing with the learning loss, as we've talked about in the other two presentations. Our ESSER funding is ending. Um, we, we have, we will continue to do this. We will provide maintenance to make sure that our facilities are in good condition. We've spent a tremendous amount, millions of dollars, to make sure that our, con our, our facilities are in good conditions. And then we have contract negotiations with two units this year, and those are drivers to the budget. That's the 50,000 foot view of what we will be dealing with for the budget. And on the 13th of March, we will submit to you the tentative budget. Um, do any board members have any questions for Dr. Rocco? Scott, in looking at all the numbers that we have and we may have coming, 
Are we considering anything like, um, well, you wouldn't be able to do it now, but to put away money for a, for a new school building because of the projection in the school enrollment, how are we going to fit, you know, two pounds of cabbage in a one pound bag? Last night we had another facility strategic planning committee meeting and I want to let the public know you can come to any one of those meetings, you can come to one of them, all of them, as many as you want. We want more people there to have a say in what our facilities are going to look like. Uh, so we're hoping to have a plan to the board with suggestions coming up in the probably within the next six months. Uh, but you are right. We're we're putting more kids into spaces and we have less space. So that committee is looking at a lot of things. What property do we have and buildings that can be expanded on? What is the grade spans that we have within our buildings? Are there, are there spaces around town where we could, we could either create a new school or build a new school? And then what does that look like for the district? So that's kind of our plan that we've been going forward with. There's a dedicated group. Uh, Ms. Thornton, Ms. Harvey has been there, Mr. Kank has been there. There's a dedicated group of people, staff, parents, community members that come to these meetings, and we're just starting to draft out the reports now. You know, there's a couple locations. I won't mention them now because it wouldn't be fair, uh, but um, the bottom line is, do you think, I guess hypothetical question right now, <laughs> not even hypothetical, do you, act, do you think we're going to need new buildings or can we expand on the buildings we have now, new construction, not, um, not trailers, okay, because I just think uh, they do the job, but in the long run, I don't think it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's worth it. Uh, I think we just throw money down there. I agree with you. Proverbial. It's a temporary solution, the trailers. So there are a number of buildings where we can add on to because there's enough space to do that. The question would be, what does that space look like? And then what is the grade span that needs to be included in our buildings so that we can, we can kind of even out where we've got a lot of enrollment in one building and then average or below average enrollment in another building. Just for an FYI, remember in the past when we did new schools, Crockett being the last I can remember, we always forget to include the staffing and the furniture and the infrastructure yeah. and all that. So if, if that, um, ever comes to fruition, don't forget those items. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But we, are, we are looking at it now because we understand if that growth continues above what the demographer says, we're going to have to act within the next three to five years. That's the reality. Can I, I just add that, that I would invite you to participate in our discussions because that exact question, we spent over an hour in a small group discussing the very minutia of what that would be, whether it be a new building, building at a new site, building onto existing schools and how we could do it efficiently. So that is part of the discussion. I invite anyone in the community who has an opinion on that to come to the next meeting. There's another thing you can look at now that you mentioned that, I think, uh, probably came up a while back, and a while back to me might mean 20 years ago, um, a, a, a reconstruction of, or reallocation of how we send our youngsters to school here, okay? So I don't know if that would help or hinder. Obviously, the high schools really can't, you know, they could change, but I'm not projecting that. I'm looking at the, the elementary schools, you know, how can we get the best for our buck for the schools that we have and or we may have to build one somewhere. The only property that we have now, to the best of my recollection, is adjacent to Crockett. And originally when we built that school or we took that property over, I think there was some mention of maybe that being used in the future, not knowing that the future was going to be this, come this there, quick. There, there is, that's part of our discussion, and we have identified other schools that have property where you could build up or out. So. That's why I invite the community yeah. to participate in that discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Santa. Any other questions for Dr. Rocco on the macro budget? Okay, so we will move on to committee reports. Um, 
Mr. Kanko, would you like to take us through the Finance and Operation Committee report? Yes, I will. The uh, Finance and Operations Committee initiatives meeting took place on uh, Valentine's Day. We all know the date, uh, 8.30 in the morning. Um, I would like to thank all who attended, senior staff and committee members. Um, we had a very, very short agenda. Part of the agenda was about the macro budget, which we all saw tonight, so I'm just gonna skip over that part. Um, and with, and the, you know, the dates and times, the dates uh, uh, that everything is, uh, is gonna be ready to, for presentation to the, uh, to the public. Um, we had a, uh, we had a uh, meeting about, uh, our meeting started out with um, um, the McGalliard School Boiler Project. Um, this was a project that took place back in 2014, and there, there is uh, a few issues with the boilers at McGalliard uh, in such a short period of time, and there was uh, a multitude of questions asked to the, uh, to the um, consultant that was there, and uh, it's just, you know, we're looking into everything right now, and then right now it's just too preliminary to, to, to go into any more detail until we get more answers to some of the questions that the committee had come up with. So uh, we're hoping to, to get that all, we, our next meeting, we're hoping to help we we'll have some answers by our next meeting that can be uh, addressed. Uh, then we moved, we, uh, we did move on to, uh, we spoke briefly about the, uh, the update on the athletic fields, the fencing and the signage. Uh, uh, the signage is all installed. Um, the interior fencing at uh, Steiner, or at East, and exterior fencing at East has been completed. Um, the only thing that we're waiting on now is the interior fencing at North, which is set to be delivered at the end of this month. And then as soon as that's uh, delivered, we'll get that, uh, we'll have that fence installed. And then we can get these, uh, we can get these tracks opened up to the, to the public. And the other, the, the, actually the last item that we had was um, our, oh, I'm sorry, not the last item, but our uh, food service uh, program is, uh, is up for renewal. And uh, the RFP is, uh, there's an RFP required for every five years, and it is on the agenda tonight, I believe, for the food service. So, um, and then we uh, we had a slight dis we had a small discussion about the um, the um, the approval for the uh, the dishwasher replacement at Grice and Reynolds. That's a capital project, and uh, that's on the agenda tonight. For approval by the board, and uh, we set uh, we set our next meeting date uh, for March the sixth at eight thirty a.m. and that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Kanka. Do you have anything on negotiations? Under negotiations, we have uh, a tentative date of March the twelfth to for the meet and greet with the HTEA at this time. And uh, the, the directors, uh, we haven't um, set any dates with the directors yet. Both, both groups are under uh, contract. Uh, they're ending uh, June of 30th of this year. Thank you, Mr. Kanker. Mr. Celentano, do you have a question in regards to Mr. Kanker's committee report? I have a couple, maybe a comment or two. But what, with regards to the... Um, <clears throat> HTA nego HTEA negotiations, I, being that there's four of us that are opted out for, uh, for reasons, um, I would like to be able to submit questions or suggestions to the committee, and if I have to do it through you, Madam President, or another board member that's willing to read them, and I think the other board members that are opted out, I think, may want to do something similar. Uh, because of the fact that we're we're on the brink of, if not um, um, 
uh, doctrine of necessity, in fact, I think that's where we're at right now, um, it probably wouldn't be fair to the participant, uh, to the members of the HTEA to have four board members or even five board members in some, in, in a case or two to, for lack of a better word, to be shortchanged. So if that's appropriate, I will do that, and I'll do it one way or the other. If somebody wants to read them or suggest them, that's fine. So that's with regards to the negotiations. The other thing I'd like to bring up is that being that um, we are and I am on the finance and um, the finance committee, and we have been discussing buildings and additions and whatever and repairs. Are we going? And I probably have to uh, direct this question to Mr. Kanka. Are we going to get an update as to? where we stand with the municipal complex if we stand there at all. I think we need to be brought up to date with what has been going on over there, uh, rather than uh, uh, think that something's gonna happen later on and it may or may not. And, and I think the entire Board of Education needs to know where we're at. And because that, again, will affect our budget down the road once we find out if and when and how much uh, that's going to impact our budget, if it, if it does. Mr. Salantano, those are all excellent questions. I'll start with the first one in regards to um, submitting questions. We will absolutely um, speak with Mr. Carrig in regards to um, legal, uh, you know, what we are allowed to do since there are a number of individuals that are conflicted out. And as soon as we get a response from Mr. Carrig in regards to what we are able to do, I will absolutely reach out to all um, members that are um, affected by that and Check you know give everybody the same opportunity um, and in regards to the other question the um, new buildings or perhaps the municipal um, i will say that technically wouldn't fall under finance and operation it does fall under other business and i would love to continue that discussion i just ask if we could move that to other business to continue that discussion instead of the finance and operation that's fine okay thank you any other questions for finance and operation I have a question for Mr. Kenka. Yeah. So um, at the end here, it says the total negative balance debt is 333,647, and this is how much is generated by students. Is the difference what the taxpayers are paying for the food? I'm program? sorry, I can't, wait, wait, we can't hear you, Mrs. Sorry. Byrne. Ms. Byrne, I just have a quick question. Is that an item that's on the agenda for finance and operation? It's under the whole food, we're, we're gonna be voting on the food. Right, okay. okay, so I just asked, so technically under um, our procedures, he, Mr. Kanka, as the chair, gives the report for the Finance and Operation Committee. Any questions that you have on specific items within the agenda, we would just have to ask those questions once we move that item. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, sorry. Any other questions in regards to the committee report? Okay. Um, Dr. McSheen, uh, would you like to have our personnel committee report? I would love to. Um, speaking of love, our meeting was on Valentine's Day as well. <laughs> um, and in attendance were myself, um, President Thornton, and Ms. Soto, as well as senior staff. Dr. Rocco actually covered most of what we talked about uh, that, that meeting, so um, I'll stick specifically to the personnel items, um, which were, um, were not actually just the personnel, but we did discuss um, policy 5830 on fundraising, um, but the, the main item for personnel that we did discuss in addition to everything that Dr. Rocco um, touched on earlier was the uh, new substitute category. So under item four, um, you'll see that there is a list of the substitute positions uh, up for approval tonight. And in that, for, for this turn, we actually have a long-term substitute secretary position listed, um, which would basically allow um, substitutes who are wor working a, a long term, which would be over 20 days to have an increase in pay that is kind of mirroring what the teachers would, um, the long-term substitute teachers would um, actually receive. So 
just kind of bring clarity with that. So that's item on, on item four. Um, Dr. Copeland also reviewed upcoming winter and spring recruitment activities and vacancies, which we're appreciative of. And that's essentially it for personnel. I will also um, mention that we were a victim of Wilson's Choir's uh, beautiful singing. And the last two DCR meetings have been canceled due to the inclement weather, which is um, unfortunate. But our next meeting will be Tuesday, March 19th at Nottingham High School at 5 p.m. Thank you, Dr. McSheen. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. McSheen on the personnel committee report? For Dr. Ferrara, uh, the curriculum and instruction report. Thank you, which is very robust <laughs> compared to the other two. Uh, we did not meet on Valentine's Day. We let everybody go to dinner. Uh, we actually met on the 15th. Uh, all the committee members were present. We started with, um, I, I sort of split the, the uh, report tonight into stuff you need to know and stuff we need to vote on. So um, the middle school academics program uh, was discussed. The district's designing one for this summer for six seventh and eighth graders who have failed two academic classes for two marking periods or more. The tentative structure of the program would be for three weeks at two and a half to three hours a day, Monday through Thursday. A focus of the program is teaching students the relevance of attending school and getting students engaged in learning while embedding social emotional learning and leadership skills. Um, the curriculum, oh, I didn't already said that. Um, and so that is in, in the works. The 2425 program of studies has been posted on the uh, curriculum and instruction page under the tab marked high school. The document has been shared via social messenger, social media platforms, um, placed on the high school and middle school web pages. Community members can also find the information on the curriculum and instruction page on the district website under the tab labeled high school. Know that changes in courses um, come after discussions with guidance counselors, the director of guidance, curriculum supervisors, sometimes faculty members where appropriate, and the high school administration. There are three new courses for the 24-25 school year, AP Macroeconomics for 10th to 12th graders, AP World History Modern, so it's the modern history, which is kind of weird, but there we go. And then there's a current events course. Um, the AP World History Modern is for 11th grade. The current events course is a half year course for anyone in 10th through 12th grade. Some courses are getting name changes for next academic year so that they accurately reflect what goes on in the classroom. Business law will be called business law and civics multimedia. Presentation will be called business communications. Telecommunications one will be called digital media literacy. Telecommunications two is social media. I'm sorry, it's telecommunications two slash social media will be called digital media literacy two slash social media. Beginners string orchestra will now be um, in, folded into um, a strings uh, progression. So it'll be strings one through five, and there will be strings one. And we have called our gallery class gallery for many years, and people really then say, what the heck is gallery? So we're now actually going to call it government and law related experiences, which is what gallery stands for. There will be an elimination of courses, uh, introduction to desktop publishing and advanced desktop publishing three will be eliminated. ELL lab three will be eliminated. Our final food courses, food for fitness and enjoyment and creative and foreign cuisine will be eliminated in part because the teacher who teaches it is retiring and uh, anyone who's been paying attention to what people are majoring in in, in education it's not home economics and so it's very hard to find people um, if any still exist that teach those kind of classes and select choir one through four is going to be eliminated the request to eliminate select choir came directly from the high school choir teachers and as of next year there will be two choir tracks 
So concert choir one through four, which has no prerequisite, and honors choir one through four, which requires an audition and a music teacher recommendation. And this change aligns um, the choral offerings with band and string offerings. Uh, so everything's gonna be organized the same way. The levels one to four within each proficiency level allow students to grow as musicians based on their individual goals. So some students who enjoy singing and performing but have no further musical aspirations can participate in concert choir, while those students who have high aspirations um, can audition for honors choir. The district is now offering 25 advanced placement courses, 39 honors courses, three career technical education pathways, and three dual enrollment programs with colleges and universities. Mr. Scotto and his team encourage parents and guardians to review this new document in an effort to help students make decisions about their courses and their future. And it's not too early to start with your seventh and eighth graders to look at this document and make some decisions about what high school might look like. Pre-K registration for students who would ultimately attend Greenwood, Layler, Clockner, Cooser, Kistart, Wilson, or Yardville Heights opened on February 7th. Information has been sent to eligible families and can also be found on the curriculum and instruction page under the tab marked Pre-K. Faculty and staff will have the opportunity to participate in a newly added professional development opportunity and this new presentation will focus on social and emotional learning and will be provided by the Child Wellness Institute out of New Brunswick. So those are all the, the discussions we have of things that you might like to know. Now here are the motions that um, we are considering tonight. Motion 12, Mr. Scotto has recommended the adoption of a high school novel by author Jason Reynolds titled Long Way Down. This book would be an option for ninth grade English teachers and added to a list of other options already available to teachers. The story is written in verse, so if you think about like the, twas the night before Christmas and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, that's verse, as opposed to Sharon's house was very quiet, it was Christmas Eve and everybody had gone to bed, even the dog was asleep. So it's a verse book, it's, it's a, I read it in, in under 90 minutes, it's, it's a very good book. It's about a 15 year old named Will who learns that his brother has been shot and killed. Will knows he is not supposed to cry. He is not supposed to snitch. He is supposed to take revenge. He finds his brother's gun and steps into an elevator to carry out that mission. While in the elevator, Will is visited by ghosts of other people in his life who have met the same fate. And essentially these ghosts try to get Will to rethink that decision. Mr. Scotto noted the story speaks to what is happening in our world today. The story is easily accessible for all readers, even readers who may be struggling. The story is rich with topics for discussion and writing prompts. There are online resources for our teachers. And of course, in our high schools, we have school resource officers who can be invited into the discussion. I will be transparent here and say that Jason Reynolds is one of my favorite authors. His stories are real. They make kids think about decisions. I have read the book. It is not only an excellent read, it is a book that um, can serve to show students that there is more than one way to tell a story. Um, eight district English teachers reviewed the book and provided positive feedback to the curriculum supervisor and Mr. Scotto. So that's motion 12. Motion 13 asks the board to approve an addition to the eighth grade social studies curriculum, which um, comes out of new legislation. Four new units will be added to the curriculum guide, Foundations of American Government, the United States Constitution, active citizenship, and constitutional changes. Motion 16 is a first read on a policy regulation also coming out of um, Trenton. Um, we have to uh, comply with this new law that was enacted last July. The revisions to the sick leave policy expand the scope of allowable uses of sick leave for school district employees. Motion three is a yearly request from Ms. Audino's department to run the extended school year program. Motion four is asking for approval for three overnight trips to Washington DC and two overnight trips to Atlantic City. Motion six is a request to approve a data use and security agreement with the New Jersey Higher Education Assistance Authority. 
This agreement is attached, is attached to the new state regulation that by 2025 and two years beyond that, all graduating students must have filed a FAFSA. FAFSA stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. This will become a graduation requirement for all New Jersey high school students. So if a student doesn't file, the student can't graduate. The law does have a waiver provision in it. However, at the moment, it is unclear what that waiver process looks like, and um, we are waiting further um, instruction. According to the letter issued by the governor's office, this data sharing program that we're um, asked to vote on tonight allows the New Jersey Higher Education Assistance Authority to share limited information with participating district employees about students' financial aid application status. High schools can then use data to offer targeted support to students who have not yet filled out a FAFSA application and encourage them to complete it. Please note the New Jersey Higher Education Assistance Authority does not provide districts with any substantial financial information from any individual student application. Under the terms of the data sharing agreement, authorized school personnel from participating districts will only be informed regarding which 12th grade students have completed a financial aid application and which have yet to do so. So that's the message out of the governor's office. This change was motivated in part by a study that was done in the Newark public school system. In 2022, the district started requiring students to complete the FAFSA or the alternative aid application in order to graduate. A study conducted by Rutgers University Newark found that the completion rates for the FAFSA rose 62%, which was an, in, was an increase from over 50%. So um, that is motion number six. And that's all I have. Do we have any questions for Dr. Farrar on the uh, curriculum and instruction committee report? Dr. McSheen? Just a, a quick comment. I want to thank the district for highlighting the social media and digital media literacy um, by naming it what, you know, naming the courses more accurately. I think it's a super important topic, uh, especially in the age of chatbots, AI generated material and deep fakes and everything. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. McShane. Any other questions? Okay. So we have the monthly suspension report. Do I have any questions from board members? The monthly HIB report. Do I have any questions or comments from board members? <coughs> monthly health report. Any questions or comments from board members? Seeing none, we'll move on to hearing of the public on agenda items. Done? Okay. So um, at this time, we do not have anyone signed up for hearing on the public on agenda items. So we will move to close that portion and move on to um, the agenda. So under curriculum and instruction, Dr. Farrar, can you take us through curriculum and instruction? Certainly. Um, please note that motion number 15 has been pulled. Uh, upon the recommendation of the superintendent, I move items 1 through 14 and 16. Second. Second. Okay. Well, uh, do we have any questions on curriculum and instruction agenda items? Mr. Kanker. <laughs> um, let's see, it's motion 16. That's the first reading of the uh, policy. Uh, I'm, I, I'm drawn to, I guess it's paragraph five about the, um, uh, it, it reads the death of a family member for up to seven days. What does that What does that mean? I'm going to let Dr. Rocco answer that. We have spelled out in our contracts that uh, the passing of a family member at different, if you have a, an immediate family member, which would be a parent, a grandparent, a, a child, a sibling, um, we have five days already Correct. marked in. So. 
the, if it's a non-family member, it's usually a day. I would say, or a family member that doesn't fall in that category is, is a day. I would say that that would be a close family member. And I would say that if Mr. Carrig had clarification, if I was not accurate on that, but I think the seven days would be for how we define family as a close family member. But would that be accurate? <coughs> you know, under our, under our current contracts, it's five days. Five days, they would have up to seven. So, but that's a negotiated item. Correct. So, correct. However, state law changed. And what happened was um, the state passed a law that expanded the accessibility of bereavement leave and made it minimum of seven days. So, when that happens, it supplants all collectively negotiated agreements and it sets a floor. Uh, so at that point, you can only negotiate greater than the floor set by the state. Well, well, excuse me, why would we need a, a motion to do that if it's the state, if the state mandates it? So uh, under New Jersey law, uh, boards of education are supposed to adopt policies that are consistent with state law and New Jersey administrative code regulations. So it's common practice that um, we would adopt something like this. Um, plus, you do contract with Strauss Esme, um, who is your policy provider, and this is part of their job to supply you with these. So when when did this thing germinate? Uh, the law was signed in on July third, twenty twenty three. It was past summer. Yeah. Nobody knew about it. Oh no, I knew. Oh, we knew. We didn't know about it. We didn't know about so, it. So so what are, what are the mean? What are the why do we even have a negotiation? Why don't we just let the state tell us what to do? <laughs> Not what I'm thinking. Why don't they tell us? Why don't they tell us that we can only give X amount of dollars in a, in a, for a percentage for raises? I mean, they're taking the, the negotiations out of the district and mandating these types of uh, mandates to us, which I think is bullcrap. Say it. Yeah. Well, I don't want to say it, but well, I did. I'm right there we, with we you, go, Mr. We, sit, we go into we go into negotiations and we we hash this stuff out. We don't hash out stuff for Robbinsville. We don't hash out stuff for Lawrence. We hash out stuff for Hamilton Township. And if the state's going to take it away from everybody, why even have it? Let them negotiate for the whole state. Well, why is the state telling us that we have to fail kids if they don't fill out a FAFSA? I mean, what if what if a parent doesn't want to fill out a FAFSA? Now they have to fill out a FAFSA, or their child won't graduate. Well, I was going to address that one when it, when, uh, as another question, because that's that's. I'll address that later. Okay. Or I'll, I'll, <laughs> Patrick, I have a question. Since you were ranting on the state, that. I just figured you'd just kind of roll along. So they're, they're what they're doing is they're taking they're telling us we have to spend more money. Let them pay for it. But let's see. If well, they... I mean, yeah, I, I don't. I, don't, I just don't understand it. You know, I mean, does that include the private sector too, no. or just public sector? It's can't do that. Revision to a Title eighteen A statute, which specifically applies to public schools. It's public sector. Public schools. Public school. Mr. Well, I, 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 can't I just say America. one thing. I, I don't agree with the the governor. I don't agree on a lot of stuff, and I think this is. This is just another way to take the, the negotiations out of this district. They're just they're inching their way in, and this is one way to inch in. And I, I I'm I'm totally against it. Thank you, Mr. Franker. I have a question for you. So, Ms. Patrick, Byrne? when the law changed, did it also include number six to attend a child school related? Con did it include all of these things, or just was this all included in the law? That's all the law. We have not added a thing. This is all the new law from New Jersey. So you're saying, so what happens if we don't adopt it? You're in violation of the law. Oh, I love it. You're in violation of the law. I love the challenge. Well, I have to implement it regardless. I mean, no one else can see how this could be abused by a lot of, you know, not, not that they're going to, but it could potentially be abused for all, I mean, Personal days, don't our employees already have personal days? So on top of that, now the now with a district as large as we are, we have to pay for all of these other things included. These are a 
of sick days. So historically, sick days were used for illness or disability that prevented you from going to work. And that was exclusively the statutory uh, definition of a sick day. In just going back several years now, New Jersey passed what was called the Earned Sick Leave Law that required employers, including non-public, to um, have an accrual method or a front-loading method where all employees could get at least 40 hours of sick time. That was the, the floor, and it was either they accrued it one hour for every 30 hours worked, or they got it front-loaded on a minimum basis. In that statute, it defined the parameters for the use of those sick days, <coughs> which included things like parent school-related conferences. Um, there was a, a number of other things. Domestic violence was included. Um, appearances in court, things of that nature. That law, when it was first passed, specifically excluded public schools. And so it didn't apply to public schools. They've now taken aspects of that law and made them applicable to public schools as well. Can I uh, make a comment just in, in response to the proposed policy? Uh, I would note that the New Jersey School Boards Association every month sends us communications and the the proposed legislation is included in that. So to the extent that we had an issue either as a board or as an individual, it could have been raised to the proper body of the legislature. I also would comment as a working parent that these changes make a whole lot of sense to our teachers who really it's they have families too and to be able to let them attend a school conference for their child that means a lot when you have two working parents how are you supposed to take off i am very fortunate to be a professional where i can carve out my own schedule but i go to these conferences wait in line with other parents who don't have that luxury and have a very difficult time doing that um, the fact that we are now including that when a school is closed by order of a public official, that was COVID-19. I don't know if you all recall, but that was so difficult on our teachers and our parents. They were all complaining. That's where this legislation is coming from, that this was a help for these people who were struggling. I mean, people were losing their jobs because they had to take off because they had to be home with their kid who was on homeschool. So I think you need to look at this policy through the perspective of why the legislation came about and that we really, this is a benefit to our teachers that we, we really should applaud and not chastise. Thank you. So, Dr. McSheen. Yeah, question. Um, And I think this is kind of going into Mr. Kenka's point a little bit, but, uh, and Mr. Carrig, you, you brought this up. Do, what's my question? My question is essentially, when you have sick days, they're, <coughs> they're earned, right? Correct. This, so for example, this um, having a death of a family member for up to seven days, it's not that, you know, the unfortunate circumstance happens and then you get seven new days. It's that you're allowed to use seven of your sick days. Correct, so under New Jersey law, teachers are given uh, a sick day per month, 10 days for a regular school year. Um, correct, they can now use those days for, um, for sick leave. There's an interplay with what exists in the collective bargaining agreement as well, which is a separate issue, but yes, they can use these days, which are sick days, for the purpose of a death in the family, which is now beyond what it used to be, which was you know, personal illness or personal injury. I mean, under New Jersey law, you could not use a sick day to care for a child. Um, and that has now been expanded by virtue of this law. Okay, so this is more just defining when the employees may use a sick day. Correct. In the circumstances. Okay. So we're not adding sick days. It does not create additional sick days. 
under uh, that's a separate statute, and that's still the same as it is as it has always been. It, it, further, you still have your personal time. So if you needed seven days before for a funeral, or let's just say you now need eight, you can still use your one personal day. It's not taking that away. Any other questions, Mr. Uh, Salentano? Just, uh, just, just some comments. Um, appreciate everybody's input. Um, I try to equate these things to like the real world and uh, I think Jason just mentioned it about sick days uh, being earned. He's correct. However, in the real world, the employee does not have, does not own the sick day. That's at the pleasure of the employer, always has been. And I think this district has always been gratuitous when it comes to their employees. Uh, some people may differ, but it's taken a long, long time to <laughs> Uh, get everybody on board where is, things seem to be fair. Mm -hmm. The problem I'm seeing now as we're going forward is that according to the people downtown Trenton or wherever the hell they're at, we're not fair enough. We've got to be fair according to their politics or their ideology. Uh, it irritates me, as, and, and I think Mr. Kanker brings a point, uh, what do they need us for if they want to do everything? Uh, again, I think that if, if we stood out like a district that, you know, I'm aware of there, there have been teachers here who haven't had enough time on the books. They've gotten sick for a long period of time and we give them X days or whatever they're called. They're, they're in a bank that everybody contributes to. That to me is fair, I mean, as long as nobody's abusing it. So I don't know why we need all these, these rules, or, or I shouldn't say rules, laws to force us to do things that in my case, it just irritates me because you just think it's so unprofessional. I really do. Um, Vacation time, you own it because that's what you earn as an employee. Sick time, you do not own that. Now, they may own it in public sector, but they didn't own it at IBM, okay? Um, or McGraw-Hill or any of the other big companies. So, well, I don't know, how do we get into these situations where it seems like week after week, month after month, there's something crazy coming down from Trent? You know, I'm wondering why your hair's not like mine, to be honest with you. Is underneath. Yeah. Well, you got nice hair, Patrick. <laughs> I, I will, from my own personal experience as a private sector right. employee, you know, I, I do have the ability to use sick days, for example, when, exactly. when the school's closed. Um, but again, that's using sick days instead of my vacation time, which I'm grateful for. So I, I you know, I don't have a problem with this, and actually, I think it's helpful that it outlines the cases in which it can would, be used, and it's not yeah. them telling us that we must give them more days because of something. It's still just the way I understand it. I, I would rather expand the personal days and or have a separate category negotiated with our unions that are called bereavement days or whatever days. You know, so you sick days stay here. You, you, we do have personal days. Was it two, three, one, six, whatever it is? All right, they could be used for anything, and they always could be. And I understand there could be an abuse by charging a sick day because the youngster is sick, or or uh, you want to go shopping and whatever you want to do. But uh, that's that's another issue. Okay, uh, I don't know what the number of abuses are. If, if it's high, then it would be very concerning. It's minimal, it's still concerning, but just maybe you can tolerate that. Thank you, Mr. Salentano. Do you have any other questions on curriculum and instruction? I had a, a comment that I, I just, I had started to raise this last month and was told to hold it. I just wanted to comment that I appreciate the administration and the teachers who organized the trip for the gallery class to go and meet a sitting Supreme Court Justice, who just so happens to be a graduate of our schools. I think that that is such a enormous thing that a student can look up and see someone, wow, I too can sit and be at the top of the leaders of our nation. So I just want to congratulate the administration and teachers for that effort. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Any other questions for curriculum instruction? No. Mr. Kang. Number six, <laughs> FAFSA. Yeah. As a parent of a college student, 
FAFSA was a horror show to, to, to fill it out. But am I to understand that if this has to be filled out in high school now? Yes. By, by 2025, it is a graduation requirement. Even if you're, suppose you're going into the military. Requirement. Really? This is, a, and where's this coming from? Trenton. <laughs> the same guys who gave us 16? And where else? I, I'm right there with you, Mr. Kanka. My daughter went to school overseas. I didn't bother filling out a fast. Where is this data so. going to be stored? Thank you. It's a federal database. So federal. Well, you're filling out a form. Right. Federal. For, for financial aid. Even if you're not even going to college, right? You're filling out a form. Where is this going? Where is this going to be stored? Yeah, federal. As as Dr. Alderson said, it's a federal. It's a federal database. We've all had to fill it out for our children, and it's. You all call it a form. The, it's. We were just saying it's way more than a form. It's data it's collection. A, I know it, it is. It's a. Yeah, paint it is a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. So they're saying that they're they're saying that there will be waivers. We're not sure what those waivers look like. We're, they're also saying, or they've said that there could be penalties if you don't have a certain percentage or you don't complete it. We don't know what that looks like either as we go forward. I do know that Ms. Ferlato is beginning to look at how we can implement this in our district for our families, including having nights where we bring everybody together and we show them they could start to fill it out, they can open it up. I don't know how far it will go. And I have to imagine that they will open it up for waivers for, for families of kids that aren't gonna go on to college. Let's see what the implementation looks like. I mean, how many, what is the percentage of students in Hamilton Township that move on to secondary education? I, I think it's about high 70s, close to 80% of the kids. So they're gonna make the other 30 Two to four years. Excuse me? Two to four year schools. Now, I, I can't remember, did, was FAFSA required if you went to a two year school? Yes, I believe it is. Okay. So even if you don't need financial aid, they want you to fill this out. Right, exactly. So what it is, it's a data collection system so that they can watch over all of us. That's all it's an extension of. That's the way I look at it. I mean, we get rights trampled every day, and this is just another one, and they're doing it at a younger age. And um, God bless you all. Isn't it? Isn't that? I can't remember what the FAFSA was because it was so long ago my daughter went to, she filled it out. But there's a lot of information on that yes fafsa yeah not just the the, the students information your tax information mm -hmm. yeah but yeah. my information your information right. correct and it's a very lengthy mm -hmm. um, process to fill that out and so this agreement it's all working correctly when you do it <laughs> the agreement that you're agreeing to tonight is merely to have a state level operation connect with FAFSA and give to us, this is how many of your kids have applied already, and these are the kids that you need to go lean on to do it. But I'm with you. I mean, there are, Mr. Zolentano's right. There are people in every community who already know that they earn too much money to get anything from FAFSA, so why bother? Exactly. All right, thank you. I have a question I have, for I'm really oh, upset here. I have a question for Dr. Oh, Rocco no. um, in reference to this. this Are we going to be responsible for helping the families fill these out if, for instance, they don't have the literacy of ability to do so or they can't read English or something like that? Is it going to fall on the district to then help? Yes, and, and we're setting it up so that we can help families. So we will have nights where families can come in and we'll help them with Do the information. With okay. Problem is, as has been said at the table, is there's a lot of personal information and that right. goes into this. So we have to be careful about how we provide that assistance. But yes, we will be available to help. Okay, I just know they're huge packets. I mean, oh, there's, yeah. there's regular people amongst us that don't know how to fill those things out, right? So... <laughs> Some of us have filled it out, and we still struggle after we have to fill it out again. I'm still it's not sure lot. if I filled mine out. Right. I'm not yeah. sure if I filled it out right. Can, I actually, I'd like to make a motion to go into executive session because I do have a legal question on this agreement that I believe is proper to be in executive on, session. On what? I'm can, sorry. Can I, I follow up on? 
Can I follow up before you decide on to that? Go to executive session because I have a question about the contract. That's a legal question for council. Oh, for the the contract for the FAFSA? for number six. So, if anyone wants the second thing. So we have a motion already pending to approve all of these items. So you want to? Table? Yeah. So you, you, you have to table that motion first and then make the motion to go into executive session. Okay. I make a motion. Well, wait, wait. Before you motion. Yes. Can we just, can, can, do we have to pass this tonight? Do we have to pass this agreement tonight? Which one are we talking about? Six? Okay, I'm not sure if we have to pass six tonight. I don't know if any, I don't, I I don't know if any of my senior staff have an answer, if it's time sensitive and has to be approved tonight. I'm not sure if anyone knows that answer. We'll decide, no, that's not time sensitive. No, it's not? The, the term says, the initial term is, Yeah, it looks like it would take effect immediately. I was, it looked like From it ends September 30th, 2024. It is when it ends. September 2024. Correct. So it's only in effect for a few months and then we have to renew. It says it'll automatically review, I mean renew on October 1st, 2024. It's terminable in 10 days notice. Before you do that, I have one more comment before you do that about what we were talking about. What's the guarantee for the security of the data is what I want to know. The guarantee of the security of the data. We all submit our information. What's the guarantee? Or what's the penalty if it gets out? I mean, because you're giving, you know, you're giving all, all this information to the whomevers. And like Mr. Kenka said, or uh, Ferrara said, people have information out there. It's none of our business. Okay. And, and again, if, if uh, I can afford to send my youngsters to wherever, uh, what do I need the loan for in the first place? I'm not going to get it in the first place. Bother so, you, my, that bothers me because what is the guarantee for the security of that information? I have, I have two problems with this whole thing. Where's, how's the, how secure is the data going to be, like what Mrs. Salantano said? And they're holding our kids hostage here mm -hmm. so they can't get a, a diploma. You know, working in trades, I guess, I don't know. I guess the one thing that this agreement is, is that this agreement is only for us to receive information from the state, not necessarily for us to comply, to have our graduates. It's the, the fact that we would, um, in order to find out the names of the students who are not in compliance with the requirement, we would have to sign on to this agreement. Otherwise, we wouldn't know the students who are not in compliance because we haven't agreed to the confidentiality. So the confidentiality under this agreement runs from the state to us. So, so really the, the questions that it sounds like go to the law itself, but this agreement is just our ability to receive the information in order for us to bug the people who are not complying with the law. But right. they're, 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 for, right. they're forcing our hand here to receive the information or your kid doesn't well, graduate. Well, then no. it's, it's helping us to say, okay, you've still got to fill this out. But I, I think that the more important part, first of all, let me get to Mr. Salentano's question is how secure is the data? The data for the for this is held by the federal government and, and whatever however they that's not secure I, <laughs> I can't i can't speak to the level of security or the lack of security i have no ability to speak to that but the other piece of this was the question is does this have to be passed tonight and the answer is no so it can be tabled it okay. can be it can be tabled i've confirmed that so i'd like to make a friendly amendment to the pending motion to table number six and Se all other motions stack second second <laughs> third second approval. you got three seconds Ms. Atwood. No, no just pick one just Ms. Atwood, can i just have a roll call on the amendment i think we can just table just table, the table, table. Right. table six okay mr salentano yes dr farrar yes Harvey. Yes. Mr. Kanka. Yes. Dr. McSheen. Yes. Soda. Yes. Stanton. Yes. 
Byrne. Yes. Thornton. Yes. Yes. No, that's all. So then we are with the original um, motion items one through five. five. 15, and I'm sorry, one through five. Then seven. Then seven through 14 and number 16. Correct. Do I have any other additional questions on those items for curriculum instruction? I, if not, uh, Ms. Atwood, can you take us through roll call? Mr. Salentano? Yes, no on 12, no on 16, abstain on 13. Dr. Ferrara? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Kanka? Um, no 12, no 16, and yes on the rest. Soto? Yes. Dr. McSheen? Abstain on 11D, as in dog, and yes to everything else. Stanton? Yes. Byrne? No on 12, no on 16, abstain from 13. Yes to the rest. Ms. Thornton? Yes. Motion passed. Mr. Kanka, can you take us through finance and operation agenda items? Sure. Uh, as per recommendation of the superintendent, I move the finance and operation motions one through 11. Second. Do we have any questions or comments in regards to items one through 11 for finance and operation? Ms. Byrne, I believe you did have a question? I did, and Mr. Kanka was kind enough to explain some of that to me. Um, it seems that we're still having a problem with our students or their parents or a combination signing up for the food program, and it's costing us quite a bit of money, if, I, if I'm understanding correctly. So um, if anyone in the gallery or anyone at home has any suggestions on how we can improve on that, I'm sure that Mr. Kanka, myself, and all the board would appreciate you know, so that our township isn't paying so much money. Thank you, Ms. Byrne. Um, no other questions? Nope. Ms. Atwood, can you take us to roll call? Mr. Salentano? Yes. Dr. Farr? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Kanka? Yes. Dr. McSheen? Yes. Ms. Soto? Yes. Ms. Stanton? Yes. Ms. Byrne? I need to abstain on motion nine, bills list, page three. Yes to the rest. Thornton. Yes. Motion's passed. Okay, so on the personnel agenda, um, so we do need to move agenda item one. Um, Mr. Salentano, did you want to take us through personnel agenda item one? The resolution for that. Yes. Let me get it up here first. It'll help us. Let me get some. You want to read this whole thing? No, no. I, won't. Oh. I just want you to move um, just, personnel just, item just, number just one. Just one item? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I move personnel item number one, resolution of the Hamilton Doctrine of Necessity. Second. Okay. Do I have any questions? I think maybe. You, you, you should, explain. Maybe it explain. Yes. Yeah, I think Mr. that's Harris, what I'm going to say. Could you so, go through this item? So the doctrine of necessity is um, something that the board can pass to allow it to um, consider an item where there is too many conflicted board members that would otherwise prevent the board from having a quorum. So in this particular case, there was a labor grievance that came up through um, the board level for the board to now uh, take action on it. Uh, the board has to pass the doctrine of necessity because there are five conflicted board members. Um, what that means then is once this motion passes, the full board would be able to consider it as if it was not conflicted at all. Um, we, we need to do this because there are timing constraints on labor grievances, um, and there will never be a, a time for the entire school year where there will not be five board members conflicted on a labor grievance involving this union. So that's why this has to be passed so that we can then pass the motion that pertains to the labor grievance, which is number 16. 
this only applies to personnel item number 16. Oh, one point shot, right? Correct. Correct. One point. Yeah. Is that what, could you take us through roll call? Is it a roll call? Is it, is it yeah, I would do roll call. Roll call, please. And that's everybody, correct? Yep. Is this for Valentano? one? Valentano? Absolutely. Dr. Farrar? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Kanka? Yes. Dr. McSheen? Yes. Ms. Soto? Yes. Ms. Stanton? Yes. Fern? Yes. Thornton? Yes. Motion passed. Dr. McSheen, can you take us through personnel items with the exception of number one? Yes. Upon the recommendation of the superintendent, I move personnel items two through 16. Second. Do we have any questions in regards to personnel items? Mr. Celentano. More or less of an idea. I think months ago, I think I mentioned the fact that I was looking at the resignations, uh, only the teaching staff. I wasn't looking at the um, non-certified staff. And within a 12 month period, or there was either 121 resignations or in a 15 month period, there was 121 resignations, whatever it was, it was 121. And I felt that to be, and I went back to 2022, I think, or I think I went July to July or July to September, the, the following September. And I think I made a comment about what I would like to see. I didn't ask for it, so I'm not saying anybody, you know, look the other way. But I think right now, I think it'd be interesting to me and the entire board as to why we're losing individuals, how much time they spent here. In other words, I'm looking at the, I'm not, the uh, Mrs. Johnson, an elementary teacher, and it has a date of the resignation. So why can't we also include in that report uh, the number of years that that person worked here? Because what I'm finding out, at least I think I'm finding out, it's a lot of people, that, the, the, I shouldn't say people, a lot of teachers that aren't staying here long enough, okay? Or there's other reasons, okay? I mean, I've known we've, we, we've rescinded things that, of that nature, but I don't think that's included in there. But I'd like a little bit more information. Maybe we can have a summary. Uh, and didn't we have a process, not necessarily a policy, that there were exit interviews? Exit interview. Do we still have that, Scott? We, we've done them. We didn't do them during the pandemic and when we came out of it. But I know that we have talked to this. Uh, Dr. Copeland and I have talked about that. And it is on, as you know, in my office, I have a giant whiteboard. Yeah, yeah. One of those items is exit interviews to be able to kind of ascertain what you're talking about. A number of the, the staff here that have resigned have been with us less than a year, some yeah. of them less than 10 months. Uh, and then as we've talked about and has been written about across the country is people in education who have certificates right now are almost like reagents yeah. in the sense of that they can pick up and go and I always use my certification as the example. When I started a social studies teacher, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of us in only a handful of jobs. Now even a social studies teacher is in demand okay. based on, on the number of positions that are available. But yes, we've, we've talked about doing that so that we can gain a better understanding of why people are going or where they're going or why what's the rationale behind it? well there's two items and i won't bring it up now because it's for negotiations that will be on my questions as somebody i will slip to somebody and i think you know, probably know what they are uh, and uh, that's what i hear okay it's lack of this or lack of that it's not necessarily that the district is in disarray it's lack of certain things and you know if if, if i knew that by looking at this looking at where, why we are I think in this report here, where there's 12, I think there's six and six, 12 individuals, and, if, and I use some numbers, and nine of them uh, are leaving because of the fact that they don't have what they could get in another district, or the salary is not as competitive in another district, then we need to look at that, okay? Because we never really had this problem once before. It used to be that the joke was, if you can get a job in Hamilton Township, good luck because there was never any openings. And the openings that were available, and there was, you know what went on. But that's besides the point. So if we can get something like that, I mean, do we need it tomorrow? No, but I think, and I don't know if the board's interested in it, I'm interested in it, but yeah. I, and I think if you, wanna, if you want to 
correct some inequities, okay? I think you need to get all of the data that you can possibly get. Oh, my battery's running low. It ran low a long time ago. Uh, but I'd be interested in that, and if the rest of the board wants it, fine. They're entitled to it. Thank you, Mr. Salantano. Do I have any other questions for personnel? Dr. Machine? Summoning my inner salesperson, if I saw Mr. Talentano's comments, um, if you're interested in topics like teacher retention and recruitment, uh, please visit the DCR, <laughs> our district community relations uh, committee. We talk about that. That's one of the subcommittees, actually, and uh, there have been great discussions about things like exit interviews and the reasons why teachers get into the profession, why they stay in. Um, and so if you're interested in that, please come join us and, and have that discussion. When is the next meeting, Dr. Mitchell? Um, it is March 19th at Nottingham at 5 p.m. Okay, um, any other questions? So I would like to recognize our retirements. Um, we do have quite a few on the agenda for this evening. Um, so, uh, campus monitor at Morgan Elementary School, 10 year service to Hamilton, John Stilitano. 14 years service to Hamilton bus driver, Denise Woolston. 15 years, six months service to Hamilton school secretary, Hamilton High School West, Pegine Eggert. 16 years service to Hamilton, teacher at Alexander Elementary School, Beverly Noon. 25 years service to Hamilton, educational assistant at Reynolds Middle School, Molly Stemley. 25 years service to Hamilton, school nurse at Klockner Elementary School, Patricia Domboski. 25 years service to Hamilton, special education teacher, Yardville Elementary School, Patricia Walter. 26 years service to Hamilton, educational assistant, Hamilton High School North, Joanne Bogdan. 26 years service to Hamilton, educational assistant, University Heights Elementary School, Joanne Devine, 30 years service to Hamilton Township, social studies teacher, Reynolds Middle School, Robin Lucchese, 30 years, three months service to Hamilton Township, secretary at Operations Warehouse, Michelle Agabati, 32 years service to Hamilton, teacher at Langtree Elementary School, Colleen Schinsler, 35 years service to Hamilton Township School District Elementary teacher, Hooser Elementary School, Nancy Potash. I I would like to wish you all the best in your retirement and thank you so much for your dedication to Hamilton Township. Um, so they pick up their $25 bond. <laughs> so moving forward, if we don't have any other questions. Can I make one, one comment? Dr. McSheen. Thank you. Um, I just want to note that I will be abstaining on uh, number 16 because I wasn't part of the discussions uh, last month when I was not here. Okay. Very noted. Um, Ms. Atwood, roll call. Mr. Salantano? Yes. Dr. Farrar? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Kanka? Yes. Dr. McSheen? Abstain on 16, yes, otherwise. Soto? Abstaining on item 4B6, yes to the rest. Stanton? Yes. Byrne? Yes. Thornton? Yes. Motion's passed. So we'll move to um, other business. Um, is there any discussion for other business? Mr. Salantano, you did bring up um, during finance and information committee report. I did ask Dr. Rocco if um, he could just give us an overview. If it's so appropriate. That we can get some no. information on if that. It's appropriate. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have two items, and one of them being uh, that. So the the township had a meeting for the public. It was well attended. A lot of questions. Uh, they demonstrated on a PowerPoint what it what the building can look like. They also had a model that was available there, and they answered a lot of questions. Uh, as the board is aware, and the public is aware, who have come to these meetings. Uh, every other week there is a meeting in the municipal building 
Uh, Mr. Kanka, Ms. Harvey, Mr. Celentano are invited to participate in those meetings and those have been everything from concept to design to spaces needed. Uh, Mr. Mr. Kank has talked HVAC and, and backup uh, electric and, and we've talked about tech plans and tech needs and things like that. So the building is designed, I believe on the website of the township that they've put the design on there available for everybody to see. Uh, those meetings continue every other week. So tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, we have a meeting uh, in uh, council chambers to discuss what next steps are. I believe the anticipated groundbreaking is this summer and the estimated length of time is about two years on the construction. And that's kind of where we're at. I don't know if the township is going to have another um, meeting or not, but I will open it up to the three board members that have sat in, in meetings if they have anything related to to the space at this point. I, I, I personally think, um, I said this before, I said think the Board of Education needs to have a, uh, a town hall meeting setting because we're talking to the school community. The government is talking to the, uh, the political community, all right? And I, I don't know if we're getting any questions from you know, some of the folks that are interested in education and you know, not uh, politics. Uh, that's what, what I'd like to see because I think then I think we would get a better idea as to what the public who supports our board of edu education um, would be satisfied with. Right? And there's, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of things that need to be tossed out there before this board does anything because the three of us plus yourself um, and I, I believe maybe the board president, I believe may be the only ones on the board that actually uh, have had any discussion, input, ideas, or whatever with the uh, with the township. I I would comment that there have been two public forums. There was one when it was just a concept, and I know Mrs. Burns was there, Mrs. Thornton was there, I believe Mr. Kanka was there, obviously Dr. Rocco was there, um, and there were people who came out to he, to tell us what they wanted to see and commented about the school specifically, and then unfortunately my schedule didn't permit, but there was one most recently where the plan itself was unveiled and the public was invited to give comments. So there has been the opportunity for the public and we had promoted both of those on our website. So how many people, how many people would you say was at the last one? Because the first one had about 30. Oh, way more than that. Uh, were... and, and of those people, do you know where they're coming from? Are they from Hamilton? Are they People, folks with special interest or, or a personal interest in the project, because we're talking about a lot of money. I, yes, and I, I couldn't uh, tell you, Mr. Salentano, what the connection was for everybody that was there. I think it's also important for the public to understand, I think you bring up some good points, but that the, the Board of Education is going to lease the space, right? And so that has always been the agreement, and it is also part of our long-range facility strategic plan because there is discussion that we have had with the township we are having with the facilities strategic planning committee the board has talked about it that the existing greenwood building across from greenwood elementary we could occupy that as a future space which was going back to a question you had exactly. mm -hmm. before when we were talking about the budget so i think those are all pieces of the puzzle here because we're making space by bringing together two of our facilities into one, the township, I think three or four or five into one space, all that one building, which would then open up space for us to do some of the things we need to do because we have a growing population. Yeah. So, but it is a leased space for us. We are not owning that piece of the property. No, and that's, that's, that could be an issue in the long run because I did ask the mayor, uh, whether or not a 50 year, I think they're looking at a 50 year lease. Right. If a 50 year lease is acceptable by the Department of Education, he thought it was, but he said he thought it was. I may not, I may have to disagree with that at this particular time. And looking at other needs here, for instance, let's just say Greenwood is available. Before I would make a, a conscious decision spending other people's money, the taxpayers, 
I think we should know what it will cost to rehab that building first. Yeah. I mean, just to take it for a dollar and it costs us 10 million to, to, to rehab, you know, or just you know, digging our own grave. And we've uh, talked about that. Yeah, there's, 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 a, there's a lot of questions that, that I have that were never asked at those meetings because those meetings basically were designed and populated by the municipal government. All right, we had a few people show up, I understand that, all right, and I'm well aware of that. We did have our architects go to that building and we're awaiting that information to be discussed in our finance committee. We had, I think we had We did, it. tell me when and give me the minutes because I don't remember. The, the architect went out. We don't have the information yet, but it's going to be discussed in our finance committee. Correct. Okay, but, but it's coming. I thought you said that we already right. did that. I said, I don't, I don't right. remember. No, 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 no. we're, we're oh, no. not at that step yet, and we don't even have a proposed agreement yet. And Right, and again, again, if I may, just in case it goes beyond my term or term on this Board of Education, ask yourselves, do you want to sign a lease for more than five, ten years at a time, make it renewable, just like they sign baseball players, football players, with opt-outs, because God forbid, you know, somebody might come into a lot of money and, and build something for you. And again, maybe we'll get a windfall somewhere. And if you want to get stuck into a 30, 40, 50 year lease, if that's possible, I'm not sure that's even possible, um, I would want an opt-out, okay? In other words, it's going to cost you money, I understand that, but you, you would want an opt-out and or an extension and you can word that uh, whoever makes the first move, that's what happens. You know, I forget what process that's called, but there's 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 a a, a way to do that. Right, but I think that the the point is that we haven't sat down for that discussion yet. It's just been in principle, and I believe Mrs. Atwood, Dr. Rocco, and the mayor were now starting that process of getting those details. That was what was discussed at the most mm -hmm. recent meeting that we had so if we're going to lease the property that's what we're supposed to do and i, I agree with the, with the superintendent so we're going to lease the property why do we have to be involved just have them build it and then we'll lease it i, I think we the reason why we're involved in it is so yeah, that they want to make sure that we have the space um and that the space accommodates our size our structure our organization and there is a rhyme and a reason to why departments are where they're at and where they're located and where the public can access us. Because I think one of the things that the public, if you hadn't attended the meeting, the mayor's made it very clear that the building is for the people of Hamilton Township. Yeah. And as a, as a citizen, which we all are of Hamilton, you can come and you can do your township business or you can do your board business. You can attend an event that's happening there. So he has said very clearly that he wants it accessible to the public, yeah. whether you're doing township business or board business or both. It's a beautiful building. I mean, I, I, I first agree to that. It's just that it's done right. Everybody knows. Everybody's up front with everything. As I told the mayor that day, I think you may have been there when I said, I'll be on board with this as long as there is full transparency. And that starts with what we're talking about tonight. You know, Mr. Celentano, we already rent space for our special ed department. Yeah. You know, I'm aware of that. I mean, do we want to, um, first of all, I think I talked to Mr. Kenk about this a year ago when I found out that this was coming down. I said, there's a property across the street, the old day Tree King. And the argument is, well, we can't get it. Yes, you can get it. Yes, you can get it. Eminent domain, that's what it's called. That's how we got Crockett, okay? And they didn't want to budge. But again, can we afford to build it? See, the good thing here is, is that the township has the, uh, the mechanism to go to the it's Mercer County Improvement Authority or whoever they're getting, whoever and wherever they're getting the financing from. That's the good part. Could we do it? I don't know. How long would it take? I don't know. But again, there are, there are questions that I would want answered, okay? And I'm, I'm on board with it. Don't get me oh, wrong. No, I'm on I, board I with understand. It. I just find it amusing because um, <clears throat> back when, when you wanted to build a school there, there was no discussion like this about where's the money going to come from and how, you know who's going to own the building. You just were ready to go in, buy the property, erect the building. You wanted the Tree King across the street. You had an elaborate plan. You no, know, Tree King's a little out of our budget right now, but that property on the corner uh, where uh, ShopRite was, 
we could have had it at the same price. I talked to Mr. Rosen, who is the person who owned that. I, I, was I remember it all clearly, we were, Mr. We were Sullivan. talking about that one with um, Jen Kramer at the time. And the thing that you didn't know, or nobody knew at the time, because I didn't have a chance to say it because it got shot down, was where the cost cutters was, where we, where we were thinking about multi-ability. That could have been had for a, a charitable contribution, OK? That's what he they wanted, uh, Mannheim or I think it was Mannheim, I guess, it starts with an M, Mannheim, Mandelheim. They owned that property. We could have had that because that was offered to that church across the street, the Grace, Grace Way Church, who happens to be my neighbor. He's over there. He's the one that told me about it. So all they wanted was a charitable, to use it as a charitable contribution. And that's where the, whew, I think that's where the appraisals come in. I'm not sure. I forget, I forget that process. Well, I think charitable contribution is not the correct term because I reviewed a lot of that paperwork the other day, but I don't think we need to go into it. But you and I could have a conversation. Yeah. So, if I may, we're kind of getting a little off track yeah, because just, we're talking we can move about on. I understand. not attainable at this time. So, if you don't mind, um, we're going to move forward. I believe, Ms. Byrne, you did have a question? Well, just a comment. I, too, attended the meeting, um, and I was impressed with um, what our mayor had to say on the time and the energy and the thought process that's going into this building. It's a beautiful building. It's something I think a lot of us could be proud of. But as a Board of Education member, my, my biggest concern is what was brought up at the meeting um, by a, a community member and also that was asked to me afterwards was, how can we as Board of Ed members reconcile, you know, putting the money into this when we need, do need to um, build new schools? So I'd be interested to know what the long-term plan is from the Strategic Planning Committee, if we can have something that's you know, short up and concrete to present to the public, I think that would go a long way in getting the public opinion um, on board with, with this building, because I do think that that's a concern for, you know, a lot of people in the community, and I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Ms. Fern. Um, and I do understand your concerns, and, and as a member of the facility strategic plan, Trust me when I tell you those are conversations that are being had. They're not something that's being pushed to the side or anything like that. They are serious conversations that are being had, and that is probably in one of the most conversations of what are we going to be doing for space and for educational space because we do need the buildings and we do need the space to educate our children and to make sure that each school is equal. So you are absolutely correct in that. Yeah, if you Thank could you. let us know when that is, I'd like to attend that next meeting as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I know that Dr. Rocco does have one more item for just, other business. Just real quick, I've talked about a lot of stuff today. I just want to touch base on one thing. I, you know, an anonymous letter was posted online and, and sent to a number of board members on issues. Um, I, I just want to say, first of all, to our public who may have seen that, our board members, there are many avenues for an individual who might have a concern with something in our district. There is at the building level where you can talk individually with a teacher if it's if it's at that level or a principal, if it's at that level or a district supervisor or a director or myself as the superintendent um, or even people have come to the board level and discussed issues. Uh, there are many avenues where members of our school community who are employed by, uh, by us have opportunities to discuss concerns. We have many unions in this district and the union leadership works closely with the administration to express concerns and find solutions. And we work very closely with our unions. We work very closely with our staff whenever there is an issue to rectify that issue. Sometimes everybody's happy with the solution. Sometimes nobody's happy with the solution. But we work towards solutions. Sending anonymous letters does not solve a problem. It causes problems. It's not a sign of trying to solve the issue. It's trying to fire things up. We're here about solutions. We're here about solving problems. We're here to work together. So I just ask folks, if there is an issue, let's work together to solve issues versus putting something out randomly. Again, we don't always all get what we want in the solution, but we work towards the solution. And I just put that out there because there are many people in the chain of either administration or association leadership 
we are all here to work together. So instead of putting something out and not putting a name on it, just come and talk to somebody and we'll work it out. Thank you, Dr. Rocco. So at this time, we're going to go to um, hearing of the public on school related matters. I do have five individuals signed up, which does keep us in our um, time allotment for um, public session. Um, so at this time, I will call each individual up. Please remember when you come up to the microphone, please state your name and address. And we do have a four minute limit. We do ask that you do your best to um, stay to that four minute limit, that everybody has an opportunity. Um, so at this time, Dr. Tammy Duffy. Hello, Tammy Duffy, 109 Sweetbriar Avenue. One of the things that was said this evening was to correct inequities, you need to look at all the data. You just said that. I agree with you. In 2000, the census for Hamilton Township demonstrated we had 87,000 and change people living here. The poverty level at that point was 2.8 for families. Today, we have over 92,000 people that live here, and the poverty level is 10%. It has been documented time and time again that poverty and increase in poverty has a direct effect on crime and violence in what we see. We need to take school safety as the most important factor in every decision we make. We need to focus on how we can grow as a team, bringing the community in, maybe doing a town hall meeting, as I had suggested to Dr. Rocco. We see violence everywhere. We saw what happened at the recent Super Bowl parade, right? And our kids see this. We also have people in higher levels in leadership positions, whether it's political, in different companies where they're not so respectful, they're not so civil to each other. And our kids see this. It's important to teach kids really strong ethics on civility. In the presentation you did this evening, Dr. Rocco, I thank you very much for doing that. Um, and I look forward to seeing more things like that. Um, communication and collaboration with the community is key to success in all of our educational sectors. And the community, the board, the parents, all must work together to drive the solutions. If a teacher expresses a need, we have to help them. If a kid needs a need, has a need, we have to help them as well. The local school officials, everybody sitting here, has you have the best position to address the issues regardless of what's going on in state or federal. Focus on our local community. And with cooperation with whether it's city or county law enforcement agencies, you talked about the violence data that you presented. Um, and I'll say again, to correct any inequities, you need to look at all of the data, right? So if we look at this, the data from the state, and I had emailed you the comparison of all, all the data, it shows a bit of a different picture, right? So let's just look at all of the data, take it all into consideration and have that difficult discussion about how we make it better, right? Because in the end, it's all about the kids, right? We want them all to be successful. We want our teachers to have a safe environment as well. So in closing, I would like to thank you for continuing uh, to engage in very meaningful discussions, difficult discussions, right? And to continue those conversations on how we meet the needs of the children we serve and the most important work lies ahead, right? You presented a lot of data today that focused on what happened to the kids during COVID, and it's going to take a long time for that to get better. So. My challenge to every single one of you is to please engage even more deeply in our commu in community conversations as every school and district strives to provide high quality educational experience for each child through our local plans. 
we cannot waver from the commitment to strive collectively and continuously to improve current and future opportunities for all students. And I'll say it again, to correct inequities, let's look at all the data. Thank you. Thank you. Janice Glonick. Janice Glanick, 432 Trinity Avenue, Cornell Heights. Okay, um, two weeks ago today, something happened at Alexander I never thought, I never dreamed could have happened. Some parents came to the door as school opened. We let four of them in. Meanwhile, a father was going down the street, knocking on everybody's car window and trying to get them to go to the school. And um, one mother who was let in got a bit vocal and all of this was because the new health curriculum was being taught that day. Some staff also received text messages. Some were not so nice. One said it is wrong, immoral, and evil, and anyone and everyone should burn. They also got a message from Georgia, how it came from there. Somebody must have put on Facebook that's what, that this lesson was going on. And so they decided to send a text too. Uh, the one mother who was getting upset was told that she could opt out, and she said she had no idea she could do that, even though a notice went home in September, and our gym teachers put out a notice the week before that this lesson was going to be taught, but she did not read the notice. Our fifth grade teacher figured something might go off bad, and she turned around, one of our fifth grade teachers, and she emailed every single parent in her room and said, there's a note coming home, read it from beginning to end, not the beginning and just the end sentence. Our gym teachers are young, needless to say, they got upset. And they had to teach the lesson or they'd be fired. And so they were, you know, and with all this hoopla, so we got them calmed down. And plus, this all came from the state. It didn't come from us, it came from the state. And I think the state should be notified that this kind of thing is happening and what the teachers had to go through so that they know that some of the decisions, you just don't make decisions without thinking what are the consequences. Um, luckily, I still had my notes from January 23rd when we discussed all this thing, and thank God you removed the really bad stuff. I hate to see what they would have done if that stuff was still left in. And then the thought came to me that the parents don't want the LBGTQ and other things taught, and yet the lesson they were demonstrating is you use force to change what you don't like instead of meetings and discussions. Now tell me. Which was a better choice, when about the LBGQ or show this kind of behavior? So um, things did settle down. Last week, they finally went through the lesson, and everything's back to normal, and hopefully it'll stay that way. But I do think the state should be notified that certain things do happen from the decisions they make so that they know, you know, think ahead, and that certain things like this do happen, and hopefully everything will stay the same, and maybe hopefully it didn't happen in any of the schools in the township. Thank you, Ms. Klonick. <laughs> Melissa Spitzer. I know I'm going to go beyond four minutes <laughs> a little bit. Uh, Melissa Spitzner, good evening. I'm Melissa Spitzner and I'm here in my capacity as president of Steiner Afterprom and also as president of the Steiner PTSA. We've been asking pointed questions since late October regarding the facility request application, the restriction of inflatables and bounce houses. To date, we have not received answers to those targeted questions. I'm not here to just ask for approval for this one event. We wanna understand the why and the how of the policy and want to push for a thorough review of those whys and hows, and if necessary, a revision to the policy. This is as much an attempt to seek information as it is to seek approval for our event and provide an after prom that has activities that will engage 17 to 18 year olds. This isn't just for our organization, but information for all of the district PTAs and any other organizations benefiting the students. Interactive inflatables such as those we are seeking to have this year at our after prom were approved and present in at least as early as 2004 and up until 2019. 
I have photos and I've had conversations with the past chairmen who have run those events. During all of those years, the Board of Ed was aware of the inflatables as amusements at the after prom party. Um, the company they used then, as with the company we would use this year, sent trained people with them to monitor how they were being used. Things that we want to know is where does, does the no inflatables stem from? Our review of the district policy 7510 does not indicate any prohibition of inflatables. Only the facility use application form does. Both are Board of Ed documents. Um, Hamilton's policies are similar, if not identical, to a number of other districts I have researched, and I don't see those restrictions. Ms. Harvey has informed me that the administration has the final say, but the administration has indicated that they are following a Board of Ed policy. If the Board of Ed writes the policy, we would like to know how it came to this policy, which is what we have not been provided to date. And here when I say policy, I mean the facility use application because the actual policy contains no language regarding inflatables. The Steinert High School administration approves of our use of the interactive inflatables for the after prom. So I'm not sure which arm of the administration makes that decision. But I do know that no one from the district administration has contacted Brian Rogers, our principal, for his opinion on these activities. Um, I feel that this is circular and I'm, I'm seeking an answer. Um, another question we have is, and it will play in, is, is the recommendation of no inflatables strictly from the district's insurance broker? Um, and if so, has there been any consultation with other brokers or other districts comparable in size um, to determine what an industry standard might be? I've reviewed a number of other New Jersey school district policies and facility request forms, and I have found no others with this restriction. When the application was last, when was the application last revised to include the no inflatables? Because we have had inflatables in prior years up to 2019. Please provide a timeline so that we can understand the life cycle of the policy or the revisions to the application what was the date of the meeting and the minutes from that meeting. In December, uh, an email from the board uh, informed me that there is not, that there's safety concerns for inflatables. It's not just limited to a concern for liability. And there is also a concern that the students would be injured, particularly where the board has no oversight into the vendor um, and how they, and how they um, enforce safety. I have since provided uh, the safety protocols from the vendor we plan to use. Um, they have protocols pertaining to the behavior on the equipment, height and weight restriction, posted rules, and trained staff attendance, which we have to pay for, that will be in attendance the entire evening. Ms. They are also regulated by the state. Ms. Spitzer, as I, I do apologize, though your time is up, but what I would like to do is you do have quite a few questions. Um, and we want to try our best to get those answered for you. So um, we don't normally do this, but I would like Dr. Rocco to be able to address this for you. Okay. So Ms. Spitzer, um, my, my discussion with you, and, and we've talked about the fact that we have not authorized the inflatables to be there, it stems from a couple of things. Number one, our insurance company does not recommend that we do that. And that recommendation from our insurance company is based on liability. And that liability is based on the fact that in 2015, there were inflatables in the district and there was an injury. And a student got injured, a serious injury. Now, you had mentioned that there was inflatables after 2015, I think you said 2018. Up until 2019. Or 19. I am not aware of approvals going through or documentation associated with that. Um, and if there is a record of that that you have, we'd like to see that because we don't have that, which means then it may not have been filled out. And submitted I don't to have us. the forms back to that date, but I do have photos from the events. And I and, did have people here with me, but they and I don't leave. think there we have forms going back that far and we can take a look again at that. So I'm not sure if the forms were filled out properly. Or they asked the proper permission. I'm saying I'm not saying they did or did not do that. It's just we don't have that documentation to verify that at this point. But from 2015 on, our insurance company would say that this is a liability and a danger based on the fact that there was injury to a student using them. 
I understand the perspective where you're coming from to provide an event and activities for students, but based on the insurance recommendation, our recommendation of not having those there is simply based on the fact that it is not it is not a recommendation from our insurance. I understand. So that's a recommendation. There's also can be case by case reviews of of each matter, which is also what I understand occurs. Um, at the, the board and administration level. If the injury that you're speaking of is, is what I was told is that a, a student athlete had a serious injury and missed an entire season, I, I find that, that I, I, so regardless, gonna, we're not in, there's risks everywhere. There, in my mind, there are so risks everywhere. I, I'm gonna, I've answered your, I've tried to answer your questions. I, I don't wanna get into a debate because we don't do this. Those who have come okay. before know that we don't go back and forth, but I think it was, in, it was imperative to try and provide you some answer of why we have said no based on the liability associated with it. Um, and, and, and let me put this to you this way. We don't, we try not to say no on things with kids because we want kids involved we want kids active but there is enough here between our insurance company and a past event where we feel that this is not an environment where we want to engage in for our students and that and and so can we, i request a further meeting then with just with you and i not here not just you i mean you as a whole because i have other points to make and i I have requested this information since October. Ms. Spitzer, and I appreciate your time, and I want to be able to address your concerns. So if you could, if you could please leave your name and contact information with Dr. Altabello, and we will get back to you, and we will see what we can do to further continue the discussion. Thank you. Okay? Yeah. Um, so, Jennifer, and I'm sorry, is it Breckow? Okay. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Brokaw, and this is my husband, Brian, 243 Bentley Avenue. We are the parents of Michael Brokaw, a five-year-old kindergarten student at Coozer Elementary. Michael was diagnosed with ADHD and a developmental disorder by a developmental pediatrician on 9-21-23. We requested a child study team meeting to address Michael's diagnosis, and we were told by the child study team they didn't feel it was warranted to conduct a comprehensive evaluation, as the child study team felt his medical diagnosis from a doctor was not sufficient data to warrant an evaluation. Instead, we were offered a 504, which is a dollar and cents solution, and for the record, hasn't always been followed. On Michael's first day of school, he went on a bus. He didn't return home on a bus. The staff at Coozer didn't realize he was a bus student, nor did he. The solution was a one-week safety plan. Less than a week after, there was an incident where parents grew violent, fences were knocked down, along with several verbal altercations in front of the school at pickup, and that traumatized Michael. Shortly after that, we received a call. Michael was pushed by a peer, and he pushed him back. And then another call that he was stabbed in the hand with a pencil by a friend. To our disdain and gross concerns with what seemed to be a complicated relationship with the staff at Coozer, I asked Michael be transferred to Clockner Elementary, which is of exact equal distance from our home, and we're willing to go for, forego transportation in hopes of a zero dollar solution. The superintendent personally told me no. On 1213, we received a call stating Michael was struggling with completing tasks and following directions. The call that brought us here tonight was on 126, stating Michael had a HIB report filed against him because he called another student the n-word we have never spoke this word in our home we were told that tonight is where the board of ed would decide michael's fate of his investigation based solely on the school's investigation 
and we could not appeal it until after a decision was made. We requested the opportunity to provide Michael's testimony and we were denied. So we are here to do just that. As you listen to this recording, I ask why one would expect any different type of a behavior from a child with a medical disability that the, the district refuses to recognize under the law of a FAPE. This is uh, within seconds of him getting off the bus at Pope Avenue, his bus stop. Michael, come here, come on here. How was school? What happened in school today? Somebody told me to say something. Somebody told you to say something? Mm -hmm. Do you remember the kid who told you to say that? You remember his name? Mm, Joaquin. Joaquin? So is he in your class? So Joaquin turned to you and he said what? He told me to say... Uh, I forgot what that word was. You forgot what the word was? Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard that word before? Mm -hmm. Joaquin said it to me. Joaquin said it to you? Mm -hmm. That's how you learn the word, right? Mm -hmm. Sounds like it. So I know you don't talk like that. We don't talk like that. But um, so Joaquin turned to you, told you to say it, and then what happened when you said it? Mm. Um, I said it. And then what happened after that? Mm. He told us to warn He told the teacher? Okay. So he told you to say a bad word and then when you said it he went and ran and told the teacher and then you apologize i'm sorry this is our own time Thank no you. it's not actually so there's a four minute limit we have observed that for the you decade that i've been working here absolutely. you talked about a bounce okay. house and at a senior there prom. is an opportunity okay. to file an appeal of a decision that you disagree with that is communicated to you in writing and so while you can use the four minutes, the four minutes are now up. If the decision that comes out to you is one that you disagree with, it specifies in the letter how to appeal it to the Board of Education. The hearing that occurs before the Board of Education then occurs in an executive session or in a committee session outside the view of the public. And then the board at that point makes a decision. What occurs tonight is a report, you may have heard this earlier today, is made by, to the board. But the board doesn't take a vote on that report. It is merely a report to the board. So the board takes no action to vote yes or no on HIBs tonight. Once you get that written decision, it will let you know whether you want to appeal or not. That decision, as far as I can see, has not been issued yet. And so what I would say to you now is, this is premature and you should wait for that decision to be issued first and then decide whether or not you want to take the action to appeal it to the board. Joanne Bruno. She's quit. She's waving. She doesn't want to go. You're choosing no. not. Okay. okay. Um, so that does conclude um, hearing of the public. Um, and at this time, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Opposed? No. Motion passes. Oh.